From the time it first appeared, SCP-UBU has brought nothing but endless pain and destruction without even the promise of death as a release. It dug holes in the ground and buried millions of people alive. It threw cargo ships out of the Earth's gravitational pull, throwing them so hard that several of them landed on the moon. It drove humans to abandon society, take to floating cities of people drugged into a permanent sleep. The SCP Foundation could not stop it. One furious immortal researcher fueled by rage and pain could not stop it. But still, there is a home for humanity in the form of a child and a frog puppet. One of the most fascinating and powerful groups of interest known to the SCP Foundation is the Three Moons Initiative. What exactly is the Three Moons Initiative? In short, they are an extra-dimensional human organization based in Korbanek, an afterlife dimension also known as SCP-2922-C. The initiative was first founded approximately 14,000 years ago, with the express purpose of establishing human colonies in the afterlife. The initiative judges the sins of deceased humans and selects their associated punishments and rewards via a two-thirds majority vote of the Perdition Committee. The Humanity Defense Corps is the initiative's military branch, which acts as a multi-dimensional security force protecting the human race from harm. This branch keeps a close eye on Earth, carrying out covert operations in its defense. Initiative personnel always act in what they believe to be humanity's best interest, but they are not a perfect organization. Like any group, they have been guilty of poor communication, overreach, and struggles with internal bureaucracy. In spite of these flaws, the SCP Foundation and the Three Moons Initiative have established peace and cooperation via the Treaty of Cagnazo. Three Moons Initiative personnel Tamino and Metapne were strolling through the landscape of Korbanek on an ordinary patrol, walking beneath the sea-green sky and black clouds, when suddenly a new person manifested in the area. They must have been recently deceased. He introduced himself to the two officers as Aaron Gualtieri of the SCP Foundation. They welcomed him to the afterlife and ushered him to a proper screening area. As he underwent the usual intake process, Gualtieri seemed incredibly distressed about something other than his recent death. They asked the man to explain what troubled him, and he told them quite the story. On May 12, 2588, humanity was going to meet a destructive force it would be entirely unprepared to combat. SCP-UBU, an enormous, hairless, white beast with no facial features except a mouth and an insatiable appetite for violence, which would manifest in Greenland where it would cause an end-of-death scenario and beat humanity's collective spirit into the ground. It would hunt endlessly across the globe, turning every city to rubble and destroying the ground until the Earth's surface was mostly ocean and garbage. It would destroy SCP-682, once thought to be a threat without equal. A former SCP Foundation 05 council member, Dr. Michaud, traveling back in time to try and stop this tragedy and to warn the SCP Foundation about it, but all of his attempts to defeat the beast had been unsuccessful. The Foundation had not allocated him the resources he had asked for, and had not partnered with him as he had hoped. He had attempted to take matters into his own hands, creating human replicants of himself and taking over the world again and again, in hopes of creating a strong enough army to defeat the beast. He had a personal vendetta against the monster. After it had tortured him with a twisted approximation of bath time using his own wife as a scrub brush, he had grand plans for the revenge he would enact once the beast could be contained. But no matter what he did, no matter how much collateral damage, it wasn't enough. Nothing was ever enough. The Three Moons personnel were horrified to hear about this senseless tragedy, but one aspect of Gualtieri's account stuck out to them. His description of the vile beast that was SCP-UBU sounded incredibly familiar. The more they thought about his story, the more familiar it sounded. Soon enough, Tamino and Matapang realized exactly what it was, a creature native to Korbanek that had somehow made its way to Earth. In the meantime, they provided as much support to the Fallen Foundation employee as they could, helping him to acclimate to his new home in the afterlife. He was given a promotion and welcomed into the ranks of their Foundation Continuance Program, so he could continue the research he was so passionate about even after death. 
Now that the three moons knew what this threat was, they also knew how to stop it. And with the fate of humanity hanging in the balance, they needed to act fast. Tamino and Matapeng were assigned to the task with the help of an instance of SCP-5298. SCP-5298 is a type of Three Moons Initiative remote-controlled military drone. But this isn't any ordinary drone. It has the appearance of a child, between the ages of 5 and 13 years old, and living under an individual assumed identity. They are always assigned a man and a woman to act as the instance's parents. In this case, the parents were Tamino and Matt Tapping. SCP-5298 may look harmless, but they are extremely powerful, and their combat capabilities include machine guns hidden in their forearms, finger-mounted electroshock weapons hidden in their fingernails, and neurotoxin-injecting barbs hidden in their teeth. Their innocent appearance only serves to mask their potential as a deadly threat. So, with the team selected and prepared for their mission, it was time to take a trip to the Greenland Tundra. Tamino and Matapeng donned hazmat suits, standing behind an arched metallic barrier for their safety. On the other side of the barrier, their particular instance of SCP-5298 passed the barrier, clad in white ceremonial robes that would be much too cold for the weather if the child wearing them was actually human. In the child's hand, it carried an oak rod covered in ritualistic carvings. One by one, Tamino and Matt Tapang checked the various equipment. The camera was set. The blast shield was secure. The kill vehicle, contained in Matt Tapang's duffel bag, was secure. The executor drone was en route, and the celebrant drone was in place, though it was briefly on autopilot, which caused it to talk back to Tamino before its function was overridden. All at once, the executor drone arrived with the sound of a small explosion. It resembled a blue and orange puppet, similar in appearance to Kermit the Frog, and introduced itself with a cheerful greeting. hi oh, Kermit the Frog here, ready to dispense swift and brutal justice. Matapeng rolled her eyes at the sight of the thing, offering to deliver the kill vehicle herself. But with everyone in place, it was time to begin the operation, and they would be using the frog whether she liked it or not. She unzipped the duffel bag, as the frog's fingers were too thin to operate the zipper, and Tamino ordered the celebrant to commence with the next phase of the operation. The SCP-5298 instance sang a hymn in an unknown language for 24 seconds, followed by a large explosion and a burst of pale green light. SCP-5298 exploded at this point, and the barrier buckled. Matapang opened her laptop, checking it for signs of lambda waves. Thankfully, they were absent, meaning that the end-of-death scenario had been avoided. With that out of the way, it was time for the next phase. The frog drone exited the barrier, holding the kill vehicle in its hand. The kill vehicle was an unassuming sight, a pointed wooden stick approximately one meter in length, engraved with the word cleansing several hundred times. There, in a crater not too far away, was SCP-UBU. It had manifested in a prone position, but slowly began to stand up straight, giggling wickedly. It was searching for its favorite victim, the one it had been doing battle with for millennia. It called out to Dr. McCowd in its own peculiar way, looking around for any sight of him, but he wasn't there. Instead, there was an orange and green frog tapping UBU on the shoulder. It spun around with a surprised snarl, furious that its usual plaything was nowhere to be found. Before UBU could do anything, or babble another word, the frog stabbed UBU in the stomach with the pointed stick. UBU responded not with a roar, but with a curious, amused sound. Suddenly, it collapsed, falling backward. As soon as its body hit the ground, it crumbled, dissolving into a pile of white powder. Not snow, as it might have first appeared, but salt. The target had been officially, successfully neutralized. UBU was gone for good. Shortly after this successful operation, the O5 Council received an email from the Three Moons Initiative. It read as follows. Foundation, in case you were not aware, a researcher of yours, one Aaron Gualtieri, has recently passed away. Upon his arrival to Corbinic and subsequent retrieval by Three Moon screening agents, Mr. Gualtieri informed us that your iteration of Earth was due for a bit of trouble with a certain creature that is familiar to our world. SCP-UBU is, rather, was, a Pantagruel, 
or gargantuan vicensis ferox in Latin, a common nuisance in the canyon south of Outer Scalvi. Though I would not doubt its destructive potential in a world free of its natural enemies, this specimen in particular was unusually small and weak for its species. No doubt it was the runt of its litter. It's not unheard of for a pantagruel to access one of many jump points in the forbidden prefectures to cause mischief in other dimensions, and it's likely that this one had secured Second Prince Nasdaq's favor in one way or another in order to anoint its living presence with both the right of world sealing and the eternal hunt. But should this happen again with separate pantagruel, remember this. The indigenous tribes of Outer Scavi hate pantagruel for obvious reasons. A common rite of passage for boys who reach the age of 13 is to leave the village, not to return until they've bagged a pantagruel. This is how they pull it off. This is how we pulled it off. And moving forward, this is how you should pull it off. Grab a length of wood and sharpen it to a point. Carve the word cleansing in any language into it for a minimum of 200 times. There is no maximum, but let's be honest, doing it more than 200 times isn't going to make the pentagruel any deader. Anywhere that there's free space for carving left on the stick, engrave the following phrase just as it's written here. Nai Fadzu Jalakara. Stab it anywhere into the pentagruel's body, and there you have it. As for Mr. Gualtieri, do not worry about him. He has been amply rewarded and offered a position on the Foundation Continuance Program on Luna Major. I would suggest naming something after him on your side. You owe him dearly. You are watched. You are protected. You are loved. Though the instructions for dealing with future pentagruel infestations were helpful, even comforting, there was a troubling element to this letter as well. SCP-UBU, the entity that had been decimating the Earth and tortured all of its inhabitants, was the runt of its litter. If it had been able to accomplish so much horror, what could a stronger member of its species accomplish? Hopefully, the world would never have to find out. But not everyone was relieved to receive notice from the Three Moons Initiative. Upon receipt of the notice from the Three Moons Initiative, Dr. McCowd began to repeat one single word again and again. No. All at once, his plan for vengeance was ripped away from him, his hope for seeing some sort of justice done against SCP-UBU gone in an instant. The thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the violence, the death, the human replicants of himself he made over and over through any means necessary, it had all been in service of this greater purpose. Now, what was it all for? Overcome with despair, he sealed the bulkhead of the shipping container he had made his home, all of the replicants of himself he had made over the years suddenly expiring. After over a month of continuous screaming, he booted up his old computer to type out one closing SCP file on UBU. His thoughts were disjointed, the combination of despair and denial. He acknowledged that his plan had almost certainly failed, the plan put in motion just under 10 million years ago. But perhaps there was still a chance he could find closure. Perhaps he could do it. All he would need to do was keep screaming louder and louder until one day, a higher power took pity on him and sent him an SCP-UBU-2. And he could be the one to kill and punish it. No, that wasn't a good enough plan. Instead, he would rely on his willpower. He would focus his energy via eons of screaming and manifest SCP-UBU-2 through sheer force of will. Then it would be a good day. Then he would win. Then. He wouldn't have to scream anymore. Until that day, he would carry boundless hatred with nowhere to put it. No joy, only struggle without killing, torture without satisfaction, conflict without resolution. There was no one left for Macau to hate but himself. The laboratory was cold. He wished someone was there to cover him with a blanket, but no one was. So instead, he searched for a distraction. He remembered then that the computer contained a morale-boosting video game, one that had attempted to get him to play it in the past. He had never wanted to play it before, but now maybe it was just what he needed. He saved his file, and the familiar prompt popped up on screen, its text a garish, cheerful pink. Hey, user! File! Untitled1.txt. Display evidence of severe down-in-the-dumpstitude. Prometheus Labs cares about your mental health. Why not take a break and play a video game? Just type run underscore Stwinky to join the hunt for Mr. Stwinky. 
After all, Stwinkyland needs you to catch that sneaky Mr. Stwinky before he misses Princess Blanky's birthday party. With a resigned sigh, the being that had once been an ordinary human man named Dr. McCowd typed run underscore Stwinky into the console. Why not? After all he's been through, he might as well give it a shot. Additional text scrolled across the console. Please enter the 16-digit code found on the back of the provided Stwinkage kit to prove that this is a legitimate copy of The Hunt for Mr. Stwinky. There was no kit that he could find. Nothing. Anywhere in the shipping container. If there had ever been one here, it was likely lost a millennia ago. Again, he screamed once more. A sound that has persisted to this day. Maybe. One day. The universe will bring Dr. McCowd a new outlet for his endless rage. But for now, he has nothing left to do but scream until his voice gives out, mourning the loss of an enemy the rest of the world has forgotten. The suffering he had felt belonged to another timeline, one that would never come to pass, leaving McCowd without a place in this one. So all that was left to do was scream. Boom! On May 12, 2588. The town of Kangastok, Greenland was destroyed by a devastating 4 kiloton explosion accompanied by a massive electromagnetic pulse. The few survivors that made it through the incident alive described seeing a pale green light in the area at the time of the explosion. Shortly after, an OMKA class scenario or end of death scenario began in which all multicellular life on Earth began to experience a regenerative effect regardless of injury or illness. In other words, nobody could die anymore. This resulted in intense worldwide panic in the face of the inexplicable occurrence. As the panic mounted, the O5 Council of the FCP Foundation held an emergency meeting in order to address the possibilities at hand. Meanwhile, civilians began reporting sightings of a gigantic, pale, white, humanoid monster rampaging through their cities and communities, wrecking havoc and violently attacking anyone and anything in its path. As the situation progressed and worsened, and the reality of the end-of-death scenario began to set in, the SCP Foundation made the difficult decision to lift its veil of secrecy and reveal itself to the world. O5-1 made a statement to the UN regarding the reality of the worldwide anomaly, advising citizens to remain calm and await further instructions. Five days after the world learned the truth of the SCP Foundation, the Pale Monster arrived in St. John's, Newfoundland, where it was met by Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown for what they hoped would be a quick fight and neutralization. Instead, two years of devastating, bloody combat ensued. By July 4, 2590, 90% 90 of the task force personnel had been killed and regenerated an average of five times. At this point, MTF New 7 abandoned the city of St. John, citing anomalously poor working conditions. After being held in place for two years, the monster was able to break through the defensive line and continue its rampage. On October 10, 2590, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition came together in an act of unprecedented cooperation to found Project Beluga, dedicated to the goal of neutralizing the monster, designated SCP-UBU, and stopping its reign of terror. But Project Beluga was unable to neutralize the entity before it reached Columbus, Ohio on December 29, 2590. Once it arrived in the city, SCP-UBU began dedicating its time to a gruesome personal project. First, it dug a two-kilometer deep hole in the city center. Next, it gathered a total of 2.9 million civilians, throwing them into the hole. After the hole was full, the entity leaped into the upper stratosphere, over and over again, stomping into the hole each time. When the people inside were pulverized, the entity destroyed a large fountain, which it used as a cup and drank the resulting juices from the hole. This entire process took roughly one year, and when it was finished, the entity appeared to grow bored with Columbus and moved to Lake Erie. Upon reaching Lake Erie, SCP-UBU trudged out into the water and began assaulting the cargo ship stocked there. It began lifting ships up and throwing them out of the water, some flying high enough to exit Earth's gravitational pull altogether. Two of the ships were later spotted on the surface of the moon. This chaos and destruction continued for years and years, until June 10, 2670, when SCP-UBU was contained at SCP Foundation Site-59. 
However, this containment only lasted for two minutes, at which point the entity escaped and made its way to New York City, where it was found howling and attempted to defile the Statue of Liberty. Several countries used their nuclear arsenals to attack SCP-UBU over the course of its rampage, until the Schenectady Agreement was signed on February 10, 2674, cementing an agreement between NATO powers, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, and the Global Occult Coalition. All signatories agreed that due to the concerns around the environment, any additional nuclear strikes against the entity would be prohibited. After the signing was finished, SCP-UBU crashed the ceremony grabbing several lengths of rebar and 15 foreign dignitaries, which it used to construct itself a bead necklace. The next notable incident occurred when SCP-UBU showed up at Site-19, interrupting a round of testing with SCP-AFF, a woman capable of turning matter into stone by speaking to it. SCP-UBU broke through the ceiling, crushing AFF beneath its weight. SCP-682, which was also present, approached the entity curiously, and SCP-UBU responded by angrily defecating and shouting at SCP-682 in gibberish. SCP-682 seemed to understand this vocalization and attacked SCP-UBU, demanding that it take back the insult. At this point, SCP-UBU slapped 682's cheek, causing 682 to let out a horrific scream. The slap left behind a glowing green mark, which spread over the entity of 682's body before breaking the bonds of its cells all at once, dissolving the reptile into a pool of toxic fluid. SCP-UBU then spent five minutes bathing in this fluid while giggling. After finishing its bath, devouring the reconstituted SCP-AFF and screaming into the microphone for 20 minutes, SCP-UBU broke into Armed Containment Area 179 and swallowed SCP-2317 whole. On March 5, 2686, SCP-UBU conducted an assault on Thaumiel Class SCP-2000, rendering it neutralized. Again, years of hell passed as Project Beluga struggled to come up with new methods that had not already been exhausted. Meanwhile, civilians did their best to find ways to cope with the state of the world. On March 25, 2750, former film star Nash de Groot published The Zonk Manifesto, a book based around a simple principle. Life on Earth was no longer worth living consciously, and the only way formed was to enter an eternal coma through the combination of chemicals and guided meditation. This kick-started the social movement, the International Zonk. On June 24, 2790, Project Beluga forces managed to drive SCP-UBU into the Bay of Bengal, where it remained for three years, causing very little trouble aside from underwater seismic events. Meanwhile, the International Zong continued to grow, and one mass of adherents known as Cuddletopia reached its goal of 5 million residents. On June 10, 2793, SCP-UBU flung SCP-3000 out of the ocean leaving it beached on the soil of India. Several cities were destroyed in this process. The entity then spent a week pointing and laughing at the beached sea monster, before grabbing it by the tip of its tail and beginning to drag it across Asia. SCP-UBU continued carving a path through Asia, the wriggling SCP-3000 in tow, until it reached the Bering Strait. Then it began to cross the strait into Alaska, returning to North American territory once more. But it didn't stop there. Instead advancing toward South America until it and SCP-3000 arrived on the eastern coast of Brazil on August 29, 2793. There, it dragged its unfortunate charge back into the ocean once more, disappearing from sight. On August 30, 2793, SCP-169, or the Leviathan, emerged from the depths of the ocean. There are some reports that SCP-3000 had been tied around its neck, but these have not been confirmed. The Leviathan and SCP-UBU then entered into a lengthy battle, which carried on for several hundred years. After so much time had passed that witnesses could scarcely remember a time when it wasn't happening, the fight between SCP-UBU and SCP-169 came to a halt. Much as it had with SCP-682, SCP-UBU slapped SCP-169 across the face with such force that its cell bonds dissolved and it melted into a puddle of fluid which was lost beneath the ocean waves. SCP-169 was reclassified, neutralized. December 11, 3020 marked the start of a 10-year period of inactivity for SCP-UBU, 
Ordinarily, one would expect this to come with a sense of relief. However, even in spite of the global immortality, the collateral damage from SCP-UBU's centuries of carnage had rendered the surface of the Earth uninhabitable, with all land now underwater. The remains of human civilization persist on a single archipelago of floating cities constructed from ships and debris. Meanwhile, the international Zonk movement has persisted, gaining more and more traction and popularity as conscious life became less and less bearable. An enormous floating Zonk pile consisting of international Zonk followers using anomalous methods to achieve the perfect Zonk began to form. Eventually, this pile earned the nickname New Zonkland. By May 28, 3028, the archipelago was abandoned, and the 140 remaining conscious humans retreated to the SCP Foundation's SCPS Naismith. There they lived in relative safety for several months, until SCP-UBU was spotted in the water off the port bow of the Naismith on January 14, 3030. It emitted several sounds that witnesses described as mocking, before swimming off towards New Zonklin. In response to this reappearance after 10 years of inactivity, the O5 Council called an emergency meeting. The transcript for this meeting reads as follows. We haven't exhausted all of our anomalous options for neutralizing UBU. Where's the corn crake? We've been over since Lawrence. So I'm the corn cake in this mess is only going to- It is anchored 57 clicks due southeast. For why the hell did you tell him that? Well, friends, it seems the Omega K has had us up and about so long that our personalities have run out of fuel we were given from birth. In all likelihood, we'd see better professionalism and teamwork in New Zonkland. As a matter of fact, that's a good segue into what I was about to propose. And frankly, I hope you find the nicest, cleanest spots in the mass grave. Where are you going? That depends. Which way is southeast? At this point, O5-11 left the room, presumably to track down the corncrake, leaving the remains of the O5 Council there, and leaving the remains of Project Beluga with the question of how to handle SCP-UBU. According to its official SCP Foundation file, SCP-UBU is an extremely violent and hostile humanoid entity of unknown origin, which appeared in Greenland on May 12, 2588. It displays anomalous physical strength and speed, as well as reality-bending capabilities and the emission of regenerative lambda waves linked to the ongoing end-of-death scenario. The appearance of SCP-UBU and the start of the end-of-death scenario coincided with several additional phenomena. There was a mass loss of function for all the objects operated by the Three Moons Initiative. The Three Moons Initiative was an extra-dimensional human organization based in SCP-2922-C, or the afterlife known as Corbenic. This organization was founded 14,000 years ago with the purpose of establishing a human colony in the afterlife and has long maintained a peace treaty with the SCP Foundation, SCP-2922, a method of communication that allowed a human mind to make calls to any pre-established phone number, ceased all functions. Next, the extra-dimensional space known as the Wanderer's Library, a magical archive of all the knowledge from all known worlds, and every book that has ever been written, will be written, and several that have not and will not exist, was severed from Earth. When the SCP Foundation pressed the Serpent's hand for answers, a representative answered that irreconcilable security concerns regarding Earth had come up and forced them to make this decision. A representative of Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited somehow gained access to the personal contact information of the O5 Council's members and used this information to reach out to them with a business offer. The company is ordinarily on unfriendly terms with the SCP Foundation, due to their conflicting interests, namely Marshall Carter and Dark's interests in acquiring and selling anomalous items, entities, and experiences to the highest bidder. However, in this case, the company's representative approached O5 Council members with a mixture of politeness and desperation, begging the SCP Foundation to purchase large amounts of the company's stock. The forest known as SCP-4000 lost all of its anomalous properties all at once, Investigation revealed only a small parchment note in the area's entryway, which read, Good luck. One of the most perplexing and disconcerting phenomenon that occurred concurrently with SCP-UBU's first appearance was what happened to SCP-3008, the Infinite Ikea. Though this sort of thing should have been impossible, the Infinite Ikea was anomalously purchased by some unknown entity. The Ikea branding was stricken from the building, and it was converted into an emergency shelter. All of these occurrences combined to serve as a warning. Something big is coming. And indeed, it was. 
SCP-UBU. It appears to be impervious to most forms of damage, including blunt force trauma, heavy caliber machine gun fire, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Kelvin, artillery fire, and direct energy discharge from other anomalies. It did express some discomfort when exposed to severe simultaneous direct nuclear strikes, but it was not affected beyond that. The only recorded instance of lasting damage to SCP-UBU was on August 14, 2784, in which the entity bit its left thumb seemingly for no reason other than curiosity. After biting its thumb, the entity screamed for seven days straight, then entered into a month-long crying fit. Thirty years and fourteen days later, the thumb had completely healed. SCP-UBU stands at a height of 4.3 meters. One exact measure of its weight is unknown. Attempts at measurement during its brief time in containment showed that its weight is at least 15,399 kilograms. Its exact anatomical composition is unknown but a superficial examination of the entity indicates that its body shape resembles that of a large androgynous humanoid, covered in hairless white skin similar in texture to that of a dolphin or small whale. The entity has no eyes, ears, or nostrils, but seems to still possess the ability to see, hear, and smell. Its only visible sensory organ, aside from its skin, is its 0.5 meter wide mouth, humanoid in nature, with a prehensile tongue of unknown length. On its lower body, it has no apparent features, aside from a cloaca that it uses to dispose of waste. SCP-UBU is prone to vocalizations, mainly screaming, laughing, and babbling, but it does not appear to understand speech in any known language, nor does it seem to be attempting to communicate with anyone it encounters. Its primary interest appears to be destruction and causing as much of it as possible. It will attack anything that it can get its hands on, but seems to show a particular preference for attacking and consuming human beings in large populous areas, such as cities. Its demeanor is both sadistic and childlike, and it has been seen playing with its victims for hours before moving on to a new target. Due to its regenerative effect present in SCP-UBU's vicinity, it is incapable of causing permanent damage to any living thing, and seems to have no greater motivation beyond causing fear and pain. SCP-UBU is classified as Tiamat, meaning that it cannot be reasonably contained at this time, with the resources that the Foundation has. Therefore, the focus has shifted from containment to neutralization, which is ongoing via Project Beluga. Any and all non-critical resources will be funneled into Project Beluga as neutralization of SCP-UBU is a top priority. Additional information on neutralization efforts is restricted, and may only be accessed by members of Project Beluga. But in the end, it won't be Project Beluga that defeats this monstrous creature. It'll be the staunch efforts of one extremely dedicated researcher. On May 12th, 2588. The entity known as SCP-UBU manifested in Kangastok, Greenland, like something out of the most nightmarish kaiju movie never made. Soon after, there was no more death, but the world was filled with such chaos and despair that humanity longed for that eternal release. From its enormous stomping feet to its cloaca, to its face, featureless save for a gaping, grinning, devouring mouth, the entity was pure malice with all the time in the world. UBU decimated the planet breaking the spirit of mankind and raising every city to the ground. In the earlier days of UBU's invasion, when there was still dry land and people still wanted to talk to each other rather than joining floating islands of eternal, chemically-induced slumber, they would commiserate about the shared misery of the state of things. Oh, UBU? My daughter hasn't spoken to me ever since that monster shoved my whole body down her throat, someone would say. Another would pipe up, trying to one-up the first man in sort of a trauma Olympics. <laughs> Didn't you see me in the news? UBU carried me around for a week, snacking on me every now and then like I was his own personal turkey leg. It was hell. But honestly, part of me felt a little bummed out when he threw me away. Yet another person would chime in, like veterans swapping war stories over a drink at the bar. UBU made me eat a pair of my pants, whole thing, zipper and all. Then he decided he thought that was funny, made me eat pair after pair after pair of them, rinse and repeat. By the time he got bored, I'd eaten probably around 20 pairs. I sort of got a taste for them after that. Everyone on the planet had good reason to despise SCP-UBU, but no one held more hate in his heart for the pale, wicked creature than Dr. Lawrence Michaud. Before the world was turned upside down, sometimes literally, Dr. Michaud was a member of the mysterious O5 Council at the SCP Foundation. To be specific, he was O5-11. 
But that prestigious position at the Foundation couldn't protect him or his loved ones from the wrath of UBU. When Dr. Michaud was off duty, UBU attacked him and his wife. First, it impaled his wife on a broom handle. Next, it threw Dr. Michaud into an open pool of sewage in the street. Then, it bathed him in the filthy water, using his screaming wife as a scrubbing brush, all the while whistling a horrible little bathtub song. Centuries after that awful experience, as Dr. McCoud watched most of his colleagues give up and choose the closest thing to death in this broken world, he became even more determined to do something about it. On January 14, 3030, Dr. McCoud abandoned the SCPS Naismith and his fellow O5 council members in search of the SCPS Corncrake, an abandoned craft to the southeast. It wasn't an easy journey, rowing all the way there in a lifeboat, never knowing when the great white beast would emerge from the water and choose him as its next unfortunate plaything. He could see the SCPS Corncrake still floating there, untouched. But before he could row any closer, something collided with the lifeboat from below, snapping it in half. Dr. McCowd's stomach dropped at the sight of pale flesh but it was soon replaced with relief when he saw that the thing that had broken his lifeboat was not, in fact, UBU. It was an injured narwhal, behaving erratically due to its wounds. The culprit was almost certainly UBU. It wasn't content to just torment humans, but instead must have been targeting any life form that could feel pain and fear. In his own words, Dr. McCoud had put it, at least a mass extinction wouldn't have made it that personal. After the lifeboat broke apart, McCoud swam to the conrake, exhaustion and cold straining his muscles. It took him two hours to reach the abandoned cargo barge and containment site, but eventually he managed to climb up over the side and get on board. There was one very special thing about the corncrake, the thing that made it worth crossing the ocean in a fragile little lifeboat to find. Every anomaly that made the Ganymede list, the list of anomalies considered too dangerous to abandon even in an apocalyptic scenario, was contained on the corncrake. If there was anything left that the Foundation, or anyone else, hadn't tried to use to defeat UBU, it would be on that ship. After taking a little while to recover, Dr. McCoud embarked on an initial exploration of the craft. All the staff were gone, as he had expected. Thankfully, he still had his O5 ID card, and it still worked like a charm, unlocking all of the automated security systems on board. A lot of what he found was in ruins, but some things had survived. He found 10 hominid replicators from SCP-2000 in perfect working order. There was a cage containing the remains of SCP-2845, the deer, though UBU had done significant damage to it. SCP-319, a curious device, was there, contained in the space-locked vacuum chamber. This one was notable for its potential ability to destroy the universe. He found a couple of safe-class anomalies, such as SCP-YEZ, crowd control for the Practical Optimist, and SCP-FNA, the portable warehouse. The latter of the two was a portable door frame to a pocket dimension. He also stumbled upon SCP-001, last ride of the day, an old Prometheus Labs prototype of a time machine. And possibly, most importantly, he found SCP-076. The coffin was open, but Abel didn't attack Dr. McCoud. He wasn't consumed with murderous rage and bloodlust, the way he always was before. Instead, he was just sitting on the edge of the ship, silently staring at the sea. When he spotted McCoud, he gave him a small wave and did nothing else. The centuries of a world without death a world without killing, without victory in battle, had taken its toll on him. For possibly the first time in his eternal life, Abel was depressed. Nine days after he first inspected the corncrake, Michal began to formulate a plan. He loaded all of the hominid receptors into SCP-FNA, using a thankfully still working forklift. Next, he was able to unseal the sealed portion of SCP-001, last ride of the day, and get his hands on the details of the anomaly. It read, SCP-001 is capable of temporarily relocating to its relative position 15,000 years prior to activation. This temporal displacement is divergent paradox irrelevant. In other words, a separate timeline is created as a landing point. For example, if an occupant from timeline X were to murder their parents in utero in timeline Y, the Y iteration of the occupant would no longer exist, but the occupant themselves, being from X, would be unharmed. When in a fully active state, SCP-001 deploys a 5-meter-high telescopic antenna 
that functions as a Coloco wave energy sink. Essentially, Coloco waves could only be produced as a byproduct of the universe suddenly being exterminated. And ZK-class reality failures produce the most Coloco waves. In one of these scenarios, SCP-001 would be able to use these waves to go back in time 15,000 years, effectively resetting reality to a point far before the catastrophe happened. This information allowed him to put his plan together to resurrect Project Beluga. Step 1. Plant explosive charges around SCP-319. Step 2. Hide anything potentially useful against SCP-UBU inside of SCP-FNA. Step 3. Get into the cockpit with SCP-FNA in tow. Step 4. Raise the Coloco sink. And Step 5. Blow the whole thing up. Three days later, it was time to put the plan into motion. Dr. McCloud placed the charges around SCP-319's vacuum chamber. There was enough in place to implode the walls of the vacuum chamber. He closed the bulkhead and began deploying the Coloco sink. 10%, 25%, 30%. Suddenly, he could hear a loud crashing sound. The ship began to tilt. Oh no. He could hear the distant sound of menacing giggles. The sink reached 45, 57. But as UBU grew closer, he quickly overrode the system to lower the sink. 45%. 30%, 25%, 10%. UBU grew closer and closer, and as it approached, it began to whistle the tune it once used when it bathed Mikhaud and his wife in the sewer. UBU began to pound against the blast door, becoming increasingly frustrated as it struggled to break through. Suddenly, another voice cut through the air, an unexpected one. SCP-076 Abel called out to Mikhaud, encouraging him to carry on while Abel held the beast back. As Abel and UBU engaged in an epic battle, McCloud suddenly remembered something. There was an express deployment module for the Coloco sink. With no time to waste, he activated it. All at once, he hit the detonator. And then, the year was 11,970, and the date was February 14th. 13,963 years later, the SCP Foundation discovered something beneath a mound of earth and snow near the northern border of Lapland, Finland. It was a shipping container with a reinforced exterior, the interior of which could only be accessed through a fortified bulkhead on one side. The words SCP-001 were written on the side in black paint. In spite of this, the object was given the designation SCP-8048. A narrow, winding tunnel through the mound of earth and snow was discovered leading from the door to the outside world. The tunnel had significant wear, clearly having been used as a footpath by someone. But who? Well, on April 12, 1993, the Foundation got their answer. SCP-8048's bulkhead opened, and a man stepped out, snapping his fingers and promptly sealing the door behind him. He was designated Pole 8048. He was a 32-year-old man of French-Canadian descent, answering to the name of Dr. Lawrence Michaud. He made a series of claims that the Foundation found dubious, but noted it in the official file for SCP-8048 just the same. These included, but were not limited to, SCP-8048 is a time machine. He held the office of 05-11 in the year 3030 from an alternate timeline. Said timeline experienced a modified Omega K class end of death scenario that coincided with the invasion of a Tiamat class anomaly known as SCP UBU. SCP UBU was an extremely dangerous and sadistic entity who was capable of, among other things, neutralizing SCP 169 and SCP 682. His timeline's version of the Foundation launched Project Beluga, which resulted in an impossible war with SCP-UBU that lasted 441 years. Paul 8048 deliberately sabotaged SCP-319 to act as a power source for SCP-8048, thus arriving in Lapland in the year 11,970 BCE. SCP-UBU will arrive in Greenland on May 12, 2588. Paul 8048 was able to extend his lifespan by sharing his consciousness between a central computer within SCP-8048 and several thousand bodies created by his personal hominid replicators. Said consciousness sharing was achieved through a book classified in the future as SCP-YEZ. He wishes to assist the Foundation in the termination of SCP-UBU and has laid out a plan for its termination as outlined in document 8048-Zeta. There were, of course, concerns about the man's legitimacy, but after Michaud mentioned over 104 specific terms and data points known only to members of the O5 Council, the Foundation was forced to take him at least a little bit seriously. 
A motion was filed, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with the termination of SCP-UVU as per Document 8048-Zeta. 05-4 voted yay, 05-7 abstained, and the rest of the Council voted nay. The motion failed to pass. A follow-up motion was filed in response, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with their own strategy to respond to SCP-UBU. 05-1, 05-4, 05-7, and 05-10 abstained from voting. The rest voted nay. The motion failed to pass. On April 14, 1995, Dr. Isaiah Henderson and Poll 8048 sat down for an interview. When asked to state his name, Dr. McCowd also recited a mimetic passphrase that, when spoken by anyone other than 05-11 of past or present, would cause them to burst into flames. The two men were at odds from the beginning. Dr. McCowd expressed dismay and frustration that his proposal was rejected. Meanwhile, Dr. Henderson countered with the insistence that McCowd's proposed plan was rejected for posing an unnecessary risk to the civilian public. They debated for a moment. Before Dr. Henderson announced the Foundation's next plan of action, Dr. McCowd was to be terminated. The Foundation would proceed with its plans without him. At that point, Dr. Henderson terminated McCowd as ordered. He didn't count on one thing, though. McCowd was no longer an ordinary man, bound to one body. He hopped into the body of a guard, then into the body of 05-4 to deliver a vital message. He had started this plan alone and was ready to bring it to a close alone. Project Beluga would continue with or without the Foundation's support. Dr. McCowd returned to the bulkhead, climbing back inside and sealing it behind him. He had hoped to have the Foundation behind him, he had hoped they would be allies in the fight against the greatest evil mankind ever encountered, but they disappointed him. He had waited thousands of years, only for the organization he devoted his life to to try and kill him. Well, he wasn't going to go down without a fight. This was bigger than the Foundation, bigger than anyone, and no living person was as equipped to handle UBU as he was. So he resumed Project Beluga as a one-man operation. He issued a mission statement, which read as follows. On May 12, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU invaded and pillaged human civilization for no other motivation than cruelty and selfish gratification. Shortly thereafter, Project Beluga was founded as a joint effort between the Global Occult Coalition and the SCP Foundation for the purposes of UBU's destruction. UBU is not merely a threat to human safety, it is an affront to every positive and loving concept in the human consciousness. Rather than our lives, he seeks to destroy our quality of life to sate his own sick desires. Think about it. The taste of ice cream, playing with your dog, the way you felt after your first kiss. That is UBU's sworn enemy. No faith is too cruel for him, no hatred is strong enough. When Project Beluga's charter was signed, 592 GOC officers and Foundation staff were present at the ceremony. Our troops numbered in the hundreds of thousands. I, Dr. Lawrence Michaud, am the only surviving member, and always will be. What I lack in numbers is compensated thousandfold by my weapons, my mind, my replicated bodies, and eons of experience. The following record serves one purpose alone that once justice has been brought to UBU, humans in the shining and golden UBU-free future will understand that one person can accomplish through the power of hard science and raw emotion entwined in a perfect and indestructible braid. And while we are at it, you are very welcome. Over the next several hundred years, McCowd worked to secure ownership of Kangastok, Greenland through a Project Beluga civilian front. He evacuated the civilian population from the area, then spent a century constructing a superweapon. With 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter gathering pods from SCP-HNM in place, he was finally ready for UBU to manifest again. Dr. McCowd, former member of the SCP Foundation's O5 Council, had one sworn enemy. One being that he despised more than anything else in the entire universe. The being known as SCP-UBU, the monster that had eliminated death and destroyed the world. The vengeful doctor was able to successfully go back in time to the days before SCP-UBU first manifested. Desperate to prevent the horrors he witnessed during UBU's centuries-long rampage. After the SCP Foundation failed to help him with his plan, 
Dr. McCowd spent thousands of years re-establishing Project Beluga in this new timeline. The project secured ownership of Kangstak, Greenland, evacuated the civilian population, and constructed Beluga 1 in the epicenter of UBU's manifestation point. It was outfitted with 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes copied from SCP-NSF, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter gathering pods from SCP-HNM. The trap was set, and it was time to wait for SCP-UBU to appear. When it did, and the trap was sprung, SCP-UBU managed to escape unharmed, rampaging through the world much like it did the first time. That attempt failed, but it was not the only one. Dr. McCowd was not about to give up now. He restarted the cycle again, using replicates, in order to gain a greater amount of control over both the SCP Foundation and the Global Cult Coalition. 25 years before SCP-UBU's scheduled arrival, Dr. McCowd opened email-based communications with SCP-2803-A, P. Hudson Gawk a giant, tumorous blob of flesh in an abandoned, anomalous office building, with the genius mind of a former CEO regarding the threat. He informed Gok that in 25 years' time, something was going to destroy the entire global economy, particularly the consumer electronics market. This massively distressed SCP-2803-A. At this point, Dr. McCowd asked if the anomaly might have a skill set that could help prevent UBU from destroying the economy and, of course, the rest of the world. SCP-2803-A, as it turns out, did indeed have a strategy in mind. One year before UBU's arrival, 2803-A attacked, parasitized, and fused with SCP-169, the Leviathan. This fusion resulted in a creature 1.5 times the original size of SCP-169, with several heads. The resulting collateral damage was catastrophic, killing billions of civilians. When the creature came face to face, or faces with UBU, it lasted centuries before UBU made the killing blow. McCowd repeated the cycle again, and again, and again, and again. In some cycles he tweaked his plans by the tiniest of degrees, other cycles were dramatically different from the ones that came before. During cycle 273 he increased the aperture from the Beluga 94 project teleporting the entire continent of Greenland into another dimension after UBU first appeared. Both Greenland and UBU vanished on 5 12 25 However, only five minutes later, a second UBU materialization event occurred. The rampage continued on from there. Dr. McCowd was becoming discouraged and considered modifying his central consciousness containment unit to forcibly redirect any negativity he felt away from himself and his abilities and toward UBU. During Cycle 530, Makad established Site Assembly in Cyprus in the year 10485 BCE. The Beluga X unit was constructed over the course of 3,000 years there. This feat was achieved via the infiltration of the Church of the Broken God, which was converted into the False Pretense Labor Division of Project Beluga. Sarkic cult activity spread through Europe as a result, but this was an acceptable amount of collateral damage. What mattered most was the Beluga X, a heavily armed construct based around the design of SCP-2406, the Colossus. Replicate 5818, one of the many Macau replicates, was selected for the role of majority consciousness holder. Then, ten minutes after UBU manifested, Beluga X was deployed. Beluga X confronted SCP-UBU and declared the intent to stop its invasion. At the sound of Macau's voice, UBU responded with the call, Yes, sure. It promptly began to whistle the bath time song, the same one it had whistled so very, very long ago while tormenting Dr. McCowd. Somehow, this UBU was the original one from the very first timeline. How did it survive? How long had it been following Dr. McCowd? It refused to answer any of these questions. Beluga X charged at UBU but slipped in a pile of the beast's dung falling to the ground. The cycle was a failure, and Dr. McCowd was filled with more dread and hopelessness than ever. In cycle 675, the moon's gravitational pull was increased, causing it to collide with UBU during the materialization event. This collision succeeded, and the Earth was completely destroyed. There was too much debris to determine if UBU survived being hit by the moon or not. 
This was unacceptable to Dr. McCowd. In the following cycle, Dr. McCowd took a more human approach. Over the course of 10 millennia, replicates forcibly converted 90% of the human population to an invented religion called Spade of Triumph, also known as Spadism. The primary mode of worship in Spadism was the creation of as many Beluga 900 units as physically possible. Conflicts between Spadism and the rest of the world religions resulted in many wars, and Spadists had enslaved 5.9 billion people by 2500 CE. By the time UBU manifested, there were still not enough Beluga 900 units to make a difference. Cycle 677 was identical to Cycle 530 in every way, until the year 2500 CE. At this point, Beluga X Mark II was created and piloted directly by the consciousness of Dr. McCowd. It was first tested on 1225-2500, at which time Dr. McCowd destroyed half of Asia over a period of eight hours. Billions were killed. This cycle was not intended to stop UBU. It was a prime-numbered cycle and thus, according to Macau's own personal rules, was to be used for stress relief in the form of senseless destruction. During cycle 678, Macau came to a troubling conclusion. He was running out of resources. Hominid replicators were broken beyond repair, leaving only 305 replicates where there should have been millions. SCP-319 could not be secured and there were no more stolen SCP-2700 cores. To make matters worse, there were not enough resources to gather additional working hominid replicators from SCP-2000. He would have to make contact with the SCP Foundation again, and the goal of Project Beluga would have to be modified from termination to containment. He drafted containment procedures to be implemented the moment the opportunity presented itself. These containment procedures were unlike any penned by the Foundation before. They were not simply a containment method. They were a punishment. They were a vengeance. To ensure the internal agony that Dr. McCowd believed SCP-UBU empirically deserved, Area UBU was constructed within Site Beluga's metaspatial mainframe. Area UBU is a pocket dimension where Dr. McCowd is God. It consists of one square kilometer of wide open nothing. Dr. McCowd's will was capable of causing the area to repeat ad infinitum, depending on where SCP-UBU moved. This essentially meant that there was no escape, no edge, only infinite emptiness. In McCowd's words, no one to run from him, no one to fight him, no one to hurt. There would be no death in this space, and it would be equipped with an indestructible floor. Dr. McCowd's plan illustrated how this millennia-long battle had taken a toll on his own sanity. By his plan, UBU would be kept in this uncaring solitude for as long as it would take for the futility of his situation to set in. His laughter would become confusion. His confusion would become anger. His anger would become whimpering. His whimpering would become begging. His begging would become sobbing, and his sobbing would become wailing. This process would continue until UBU began to eventually adjust to its surroundings. Once it began to feel comfortable and began to experience the smallest glimmer of hope, McCowd would implement the next stage of his containment procedure. He would summon a dark and mountain-high and unspeakably strong version of himself with fingers like gleaming scalpels. He planned to destroy UBU in countless ways, warping the monster, squishing its body, and molding it like clay. Then. It would only get worse for the beast, as Dr. McCowd's plans for revenge made him just as horrific a monster as his enemy. According to McCowd's plans, he would clone UBU a companion, a wife, the first real friend he has ever had, and McCowd will harden her heart and make her despise him. She will reject him cruelly and viciously. She will curse the day she ever met something so objectively hideous as SCP-UBU. And if that doesn't drive the point home enough, she would offer her heart to McCowd himself, effectively cuckolding his worst enemy. At this point, McCowd planned to destroy the fabricated wife in front of UBU. These procedures were only the beginning of the intake proceedings. After that, McCowd would move on to one of 148 level 2 subroutines. While writing these containment procedures, Dr. McCowd smiled for the first time in over one million years. In the description section of the file, he wrote only one thing, reap what you sow. Then, it was time to try a new cycle, to begin anew. In the year 2022, 
the SCP Foundation was planning a full exploration attempt of an anomaly known as SCP-001-A. SCP-001-A was a shipping container, the exterior of which was reinforced with an unknown substance. SCP-001-A-1 was a flat metallic device serving as the container's cockpit. SCP-001-A-2 were 57 identical humanoid entities of indeterminate gender or identity, dressed in blue jumpsuits with the words Project Beluga emblazoned on them. All entities were found in and around the cockpit. They were all notably hostile and would attempt to attack investigators. When the cockpit was opened, it revealed SCP-001-A-3, an extra-dimensional space that consisted mainly of interior corridors for a fortified storage area. On September 1, 2022, the speaker system of SCP-001-A's internal console began to loudly broadcast a concerning announcement. First, it began with, Emergency, Emergency, Emergency followed by the mimetic passphrase that could only be spoken by a current or former 05-11, without the subject immediately bursting into flames. The announcement continued, Likelihood of Ganymede Protocol enactment if non-action is taken approximately 100%, XK, SK, ZK, YK class scenario all pending. I am stranded on the 50th basement level of SCP-001-A-3. There are possibly several children down here with me. This message will repeat until my demands are met. Help me. Emergency. 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 Site Director Naismith and the O5 Council were both consulted on the matter, and researcher Aaron Gualtieri was chosen to meet with whoever was responsible for the distress call. He had recently been exposed to a Fafnir-class infohazard and was scheduled for termination sometime soon anyway so he decided to use his dying hours productively. He was equipped with a hidden microphone and sent to speak with the broadcaster, while Tiri entered SCP-001-A-3, descending to level B-15. He took 15 steps into the spacious area, calling out for an answer from whoever called for help. At first, there was no response, while Tiri began to grow impatient, saying, Look, no one upstairs believes this broadcast of yours, but we all agreed it's too weird to not come down and at least hear you out. So what the hell do you want? Again, no response. Irritated, Gualtieri turned to leave, but as he did, the blast doors slammed shut, trapping him inside. He could hear the sound of heavy machinery moving toward him. He was suddenly confronted by the sight of an autonomous weapon, a massive mechanized structure equipped with drills and saws. He screamed at the sight. Hello, it spoke. My name is Dr. Lawrence Michaud. You are going to follow my demands. Scream if you agree. The drills were close to Gualtieri's face. He screamed. This monster, apparently what remained of Dr. McCowd, demanded to know his name. Gualtieri demanded to know what the entity wanted from him. McCowd repeated the request for his name. Gualtieri relented, introducing himself, before asking why he was called down here. McCowd had a question of his own response. Have you ever hated someone non-stop for 9,492,687 years? Like most human beings would in that scenario, Gualtieri answered no. McCowd snapped. If not, you have nothing to say to me, barring responses to queries and demands because we are not in the same headspace and only similar minds are worthy of my friendship and tea time. Now then, on to business. I need a minimum of 20 hominid replicators from SCP-2000 and a carte blanche access to SCP-319. This is for the sake of humanity's future in the year 2588. If these demands are not met, then in T-60 seconds, you are going to bang on the gates of hell and beg the stewards of eternal damnation to give you sanctuary. Gualtieri offered a bargain. I, I just want to know why you're doing this. This is too weird to be left open. Call it a scientist's instinct. Just tell me that, and I'll pull all my strings topside and get you whatever you want. I swear, cross my heart. McCowd agreed to these terms and used SCP-YEZ to briefly share consciousness with Gualtieri. Everything McCowd experienced with UBU, everything about Project Beluga, all of those millennia of suffering were transferred into Gualtieri's head like a vivid dream. He saw the initial manifestation of UBU in Greenland, the waking nightmare that followed, McCowd's own harrowing encounter with the beast, its twisted bath time song, his discovery of potential salvation, only to have his hopes dashed by failed cycle after failed cycle. It was all the answers he could have ever wanted, and plenty he never, ever would have wished to know. But before Gualtieri could hold up his side of the bargain, he promptly dropped to the ground, dead. 
Picard made a note of this unfavorable result. Running logic subroutines confirm there is a non-zero chance that this delivery is the indirect work of UBU formulating additional castation procedures to minimize mental duress. After his death, Gualtieri arrived in Corbinek, the plane of existence that acts as a form of afterlife and as a home of the Three Moons Initiative. There he was retrieved by several agents of the Initiative, who spoke with him about his experience just before his death. Shaken up, he told the agents what he learned about SCP-UBU and the impending doom that the Earth was facing. Much to his surprise, they were not fazed by his descriptions of the beast, of its appetite for violence and unnatural abilities. In fact, they had seen beasts like it before. They knew exactly what SCP-UBU was, and they knew exactly how to stop it for good. Oh boy, here we go again. SCP-001 Over 30 different bizarre anomalies claim this number one spot in the database, and in a sense, they're all right. Or are they? If you're feeling confused already, that's fine. We don't expect that to change. Because today, we're dealing with one of the most strange and intricate 001 entries out there, Keter Duty. Just pray you never get assigned to it. You see, when you work around weirdness, you sometimes get a little weird yourself. And nobody deals with more weirdness than employees of the SCP Foundation. They regularly rub elbows with everything from godlike cicadas to hyper-infectious supernatural viruses. And as the famous Tom Jones song goes, it's not unusual to suddenly take on anomalous traits after consistently working with anomalies for years. That's how the lyrics go, right? Anyway, one of the Foundation's most iconic researchers, Dr. Jack Bright, is technically just an anomalous necklace himself. But outside of some famous exceptions, the SCP Foundation is in the business of containing anomalous entities, not hiring them on and giving them a paycheck and retirement plan. That's why, if you suddenly start displaying anomalous traits while on the Foundation payroll, you might receive a company memo assigning you to the dreaded Keter duty. But what is Keter duty, and what kind of anomalous traits can get you assigned to it? Let's start with the second question first. The official Keter duty guidelines list a surprisingly vast number of afflictions. These include chronic anomalous illnesses such as lycanthropy, turning into a werewolf, something called Stevenson syndrome, and the incredibly unpleasant sounding photonic gastric discharge syndrome. You could also be placed on Keter duty because you're suffering from the manifestation of spectral phenomena, including being haunted by spirits, whether they're there to torment you or protect you. The sudden expression of anomalous traits in your DNA, which is unsettlingly vague, will also land you on Keter duty, as will the awakening of powerful magical or psionic abilities, especially ones which could be used in a potentially offensive manner. The Keter duty assignment, which involves being relocated and forced to work in a different highly secretive location that will be discussed soon, is framed as a punishment for the people involved. That way, it discourages Foundation employees from ever trying to develop anomalous powers on purpose. So what exactly is Keter duty and where does it happen? To reinforce that punishment element method, the Foundation has spread lies among their own personnel about where the job takes place, often involving being posted in some of the least desirable Foundation areas imaginable. These include Point Nemo, the area of the ocean farthest from any place of land on Earth, Pyongyang in North Korea, Stonehenge, Roswell, Lunar Area 32, and a number of Foundation waste disposal sites. However, the reality of where those on Keter duty end up is even stranger. Site 100, which in this particular instance is the true SCP-001. This Thaumiel-class anomaly is perhaps the most unique of all multi-anomaly Foundation containment sites, a bizarre labyrinth of non-Euclidean geometry that defies true explanation, but we'll do the best we can. In a sense, Site 100 is a facility with a mind of its own. It's a sprawling underground base with a layout that defies space-time, and what's more, it undergoes so-called migration events. Every so often, it will begin to exhibit a sense of dimensional instability before teleporting to a different location somewhere on Earth. Currently, the primary entrance to Site 100, known as Alpha Entrance, is located in the southwest United States, though all signs point to another migration event happening this very year. But knowing where the entrance is will only get you so far. 
People assigned to Qatar duty are sent from the Alpha entrance to the administration sector to be given their initial breaching, at which point the true madness begins. Let's take a look at a map of Site 100. Yikes. So there are 10 major sectors in Site 100 that you should be aware of. Entrance Alpha, Administration, Archives, Technological Containment, Biocontainment, Sapient Containment, Cognito Hazardous Mimetic and Semantic or CMS Containment, Esoteric Containment, Conceptual Containment, and the Core Sector. As you can tell, they have almost everything covered here, but just as insane as the anomalies that Site 100 contains and the methods they use to contain them is how you actually get around the site. Site 100 is a spatial anomaly of truly epic proportions. While the Foundation is aware of the existence of its competent sectors, it's impossible to map out any meaningful connections between them. It would be pretty much impossible to even travel from one to another without passageways known as the routes. However, these aren't just mere portals that you can hop through like the ways in and out of the Wanderer's Library. Each route between the sectors is its own complex environment with its own sets of protocols and rituals required to safely travel through it. Route Aleph, the bridge between the archives and the inaccessible core of Site 100, is a volcanic beach blocked off by an apparently limitless obsidian wall, where fish made from living rock swim in the nearby waters. Route Beth, connecting the core and sapient containment, is a huge and sprawling funhouse hall of mirrors. Anyone who attempts to travel through it inevitably ends up turned around and arrives back at their starting point in sapient containment. Route Dalith, the bridge that connects conceptual containment and the core, is a massive ocean that has resisted all attempts by the Foundation to traverse it. Route Vav, the bridge between esoteric containment and conceptual containment, is a massive field filled with unidentified fruit trees. Foundation expeditions have found that it too seems impossible to traverse. One expedition team was trapped inside for a whole year, until one member of the team expressed a desire to go home. At that point, they were immediately teleported back to the starting point. Route Sade, connecting administration to the CMS sector, is a huge, lush forest on top of a floating mountain. The only animals that seem to populate this forest are non-anomalous flamingos. Next, we have Route Pe, the bridge between the archive and the administration which appears to be a hallway on the fifth floor of a tenement building in a city that the Foundation haven't been able to locate. This building is populated by non-hostile humanoid creatures, who will approach Foundation staff traversing Route Pei and invite them into their apartments, offering to partake in recreational activities with them such as video games, board games, or watching movies. The Foundation discourages its staff from accepting any of these offers while on the job. And then there's Route Shin which connects the sapient and conceptual containment sectors. This route is unique in the sense that it acts as a power generator for the rest of Site 100, as it's filled with hundreds of large perpetual motion machines producing a constant 8.7 gigawatts of electricity. These are only some of the many routes illustrated on the Site 100 diagram. As you've probably gathered by now, it's less like a conventional building and more like a whole crazy dimension unto itself. Why does the Foundation work to maintain such a crazy place? Wouldn't it just be easier to keep it a secret and contain it like any other anomaly? Well, Site 100 wouldn't be given the SCP-001 designation if it wasn't incredibly important. If Site 100 was ever compromised, it would lead to an inevitable K-class end-of-the-world scenario because the site is intrinsically tied to the nature and containment of literally every single Keter-class SCP in our universe, hence the nickname Keter Duty for those working at the site. In fact, an anomaly can't even be classed as a Keter if it isn't given permission by Site 100. The various sectors of Site 100 cover the entire spectrum of anomalies, and each sector is a massive panoptic structure connected by networks of glass elevators. Whenever a new Keter-class SCP is discovered, its name and a brief description of its anomalous traits will inscribe itself on one of the walls in its corresponding sector. Ever been frustrated when the O5 Council refused to sign off on an upgrade to Keter-class for a clearly dangerous SCP that poses extreme risk of containment breach? Don't blame them. It's simply that Site 100 didn't sanction the change. Anytime that Site 100 sanctions a new SCP, it also undergoes another unique process. It selects an SCP-001-K instance for the new Keter and creates a connection between them, using access points known as thresholds. Think of it as simply opening a spatially anomalous door between two SCPs. 
Much like a good boy, another SCP vying for the 001 slot, Site 100 has an intuitive grasp of the unseen connections between Keter class anomalies. And each SCP 001 K instance is a complementary Keter class that will essentially cancel out the threat of its other half. Site 100 is a containment matchmaker. Its innate ability to use the anomalous to contain the anomalous is second to none. First, it took SCP-3984, an anomalous phenomenon that seemed to prevent death from happening to all life forms. In order to mitigate the effects of 3984, Site-100 opened a threshold between it and SCP-2935, also known as O-Death, an alternate universe hidden beyond a limestone cavern where all life simultaneously ceased to exist even down to the bacterial level. By opening the threshold and allowing these two absolute opposites to mix, it seemed to undermine the effects of both and create a non-anomalous happy medium. Life, but mortal life. Next, SCP-5007. This terrifying underwater anomaly manifests as a series of tentacle-like protrusions that snatch unfortunate creatures that get too close and assimilate them into its own mass. Site 100 cleverly opened a threshold to SCP-169, a massive underwater anthropod known as the Leviathan. SCP-169 was tangled up by the tentacles, but it's too big to be fully consumed or assimilated. And the result is that 5007 is trapped in a perpetually incapacitated state, akin to choking, keeping it contained and stopping it from going after anyone else. Let's take a look at two even more hostile and dangerous Keter class anomalies matched up by Site 100. First, we've got SCP-5501, an old camera from the 1800s that comes with 18 photographs. These photographs act as a kind of portal to an incredibly frightening alternate reality that creatures regularly crawl out of, attacking and killing anyone within reach. Site 100 found a perfect match for this nasty customer, SCP-1983. This is a small house that acts as a portal to a race of tall monsters with needle-like appendages that leave the house in search of victims. When they catch these victims, they take out their hearts and bring them back to the nest. Site 100 opened a threshold into the SCP-1983 house and placed the 5501 photographs inside. As a result, the hostile creatures from both dimensions now regulate each other's populations by killing each other. Another job well done for Site 100. Another Keter class dealt with by SCP-100 is SCP-PL-122. This is a deadly plot of land in Poland, which decays and corrodes all matter, organic or inorganic, placed within its confines. This would be bad enough, but as you'll often find with anomalous plots of deadly land, its area of influence is growing. Even knowing about it can cause it to become more powerful, but Site-100 found its perfect Keter class counterpart. SCP-1262. This is a massive mass of plant matter that grows at a truly astonishing rate, expanding by around 7 kilometers an hour. Much like absolute death and absolute life, by putting 1262 into SCP-PL-122, a healthy medium was found somewhere in between. And finally, perhaps the strangest and most creative match Site-100 has ever pulled off. SCP-3852 and SCP-2547. 3852 is an anonymous corpse that manifests in small towns, sowing fear and suspicion. Eventually, a local person is believed to be responsible for this murder and is lynched in a rage by the townspeople as a form of vigilante justice. The corpse then moves on to the next town. 2547, if you can believe it, is even weirder. It's a pack of dogs led by an intelligent talking coyote dressed as a priest. Site 100 had the truly galaxy brain idea to open a threshold and connect the two. As a result, whenever the corpse manifests in the town, the dogs rampage in and take over. At that point, they set up a kind of ridiculous kangaroo court where a jury made up of people from the town are forced to find 3852's scapegoat innocent. If they don't, the dogs will simply hold the town's water supply hostage until 3852's anomalous effects pass. Such an obvious idea. Now why didn't the Foundation think of that? Keter duty may not be the most conventional, easy, or attractive work, but like everything the Foundation does, making sure Site 100 can keep doing its job is a necessary part of keeping our world safe from anomalous threats. Now if you'll excuse us, we need to get going. Hmm. 
Do you know which is the right route out of here? If you're familiar with the SCP Foundation, then you already know the exact reason why there are multiple SCP-001s. You may even think you know which of them is the real SCP-001. But for those of you who are new here, or who just need a little reminder, the designation of SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies that are apparently kept in containment by the SCP Foundation. At present, it is unclear why there are multiple files collected under the shared designation of SCP-001. Some believe it is because these anomalies are some of the earliest ever contained by the Foundation. This would mean that they share the designation of SCP-001, as they were likely encountered before the SCP Foundation introduced their current numbering system. However, there also exists a theory that this is nothing more than intentional misdirection. Perhaps the multiple SCP-001 files are an attempt by the Foundation to conceal information about the true SCP-001. After all, it wouldn't be the first time this hyper-secretive organization deceived us. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous Scarlet King, the massive Gate Guardian, and the world-ending event known as When Day Breaks. But today, we will be using SCP-001 to refer not to an entity or an event, but to a location. A location codenamed God's Blind Spot. Located in an unassuming corner of the world is a site that the SCP Foundation constructed and designated as Facility T. According to their archive, it's a largely unremarkable place, situated at a spot on the Sinai Peninsula, which is a part of Egypt that forms a bridge between the continents of Africa and Asia. In the 18th century, Archaeologists excavating the area uncovered the remains of a stone structure, believed to be an inn that dates back to the second millennium BC. However, since the construction of Facility T, any trace of this structure has since disappeared. So, what makes this unremarkable site so important to the SCP Foundation? Why establish a facility if there was nothing anomalous about its nature? What distinguishes this SCP-001 site in the eyes of the Foundation is the area's profound lack of any ambient Akiva radiation. But what is Akiva radiation? Well, according to the Foundation's researchers, it's a form of cosmic background radiation, one that's not overtly harmful to human beings. If you grew up in a strict church-going household, then it's highly likely you would have been exposed to a lot of this non-electromagnetic radiation and never even realized it. You see, the thing with the Kiva radiation is that it is directly correlated with the amount of religious faith a person has. Regardless of which religion someone follows, a Kiva radiation will form around them. It tends to be harmless to humans. However, certain anomalous entities and SCPs considered to be demonic in nature can be repelled and even fought off with high levels of Akiva radiation. The presence of other powerful anomalies, those considered more benign or even holy, can also create an increase in this radiation. SCP-001 has earned the nickname God's Blind Spot for a number of reasons. One being that it is the only place on Earth with a natural absence of this Akiva radiation. The Foundation has conducted experiments that involve bringing sources known to emit Akiva radiation into the area of SCP-001, but when they measured, no change in radiation levels was detected, meaning that the space around Facility T does not actively block Akiva radiation from entering it, but also cannot absorb or retain this religious radiation. It might be more accurate to say that the location destroys any trace of residual Akiva without damaging the source. A lack of faith field radiation is far from the only anomalous property of SCP-001, though. During a number of tests involving D-Class personnel, the Foundation witnessed that, while in the area, it also becomes impossible for the death of any human being to occur, a discovery that obviously needed to be researched further. The first test involved a healthy human male who was left in a containment cell on the SCP-001 site and observed. He had no supplies, no food, no water, yet over 120 days, this man stayed alive, never succumbing to starvation or dehydration. 
Next, a female member of D-Class was exposed to a lethal dose of cyanide gas within Facility T and suffered none of the expected effects. Foundation researchers then repeated this cyanide gas test using 30 common brown rats, all of which were killed, proving that it was only humans that couldn't be killed while within SCP-001. God's blind spot seems to also be able to slow or halt the effects of terminal illnesses, as proven when a D-Class with stage 4 cancer was brought into SCP-001. Despite her prognosis stating that she would be dead imminently, the woman survived in the area for almost 800 days. Her cancer symptoms never advanced, and she only died after finally leaving the area of SCP-001. There are limitations to this anomalous effect, though. One test involved cremating a healthy male D-Class while he was still alive. The man's body caught fire just as you would expect it to, and he was burned to death. According to the findings of that test and similar variations, Foundation researchers have learned that the life-preserving qualities of SCP-001 don't prevent death by extreme external damage. One of the final tests to take place with an SCP-001 involved a pair of 24-year-old identical D-Class twins. One of the twins, designated Twin A, was held at Facility T, while the other, Twin B, was imprisoned in a cell at a different Foundation site. After observing them for over 26 years, Twin B aged naturally to the age of 50. His twin, however, did not appear to age at all over the course of two and a half decades. It was only when moved to another facility that Twin A began to show signs of aging. The aging process for Twin A was rapid too, and eventually he caught up with his brother. Being a benign, non-threatening anomaly, the Foundation has been more than happy to use God's blind spot to their own advantage. Facility T was specifically established on this site to house the headquarters of the O5 Council, the overseers of the entire SCP Foundation. It's hardly surprising that the Overseer Council would want to set up shop here. After all, it's the one spot on planet Earth where no human being can ever die of natural causes and will not age for the duration of their stay. Of course, this locked the O5 Council to one location. But what if they could replicate the effects of SCP-001 elsewhere? Of course, this is what the SCP Foundation attempted. Following their research into God's blind spot, the Foundation's own Dr. Marvin Scranton attempted to artificially recreate the area's anomalous effects somewhere else. His hope was, by generating a vacuum of Akiva radiation, that a second instance of SCP-001 would occur at a location of his choosing. Or, as his assistant Bertrand put it, they planned to build a box and then push God out of it. As it turned out, God had other plans. Dr. Scranton quickly realized the hubris of his scheme. The Akiva radiation in the selected area rapidly dropped to zero, <laughs> just as planned. But then something unexpected happened. Scranton detected an increase in humes. These are essentially parts of the fabric of reality and are what's often disrupted by reality-bending SCPs. Something had come into our world thanks to the O5 Council's attempt to recreate SCP-001, something impossible for the Foundation to measure or observe. In other words, Scranton had no idea what he unleashed or where it went. Following this incident, the O5 Council realized a worrying increase in the anomalous incidents they were encountering. Whether or not this came as a direct result of their meddling with the fabric of the universe was unclear, but it forced the Council to reconsider the focus and direction of the entire SCP Foundation. Up until this point, they had been an organization focused purely on research, but now they had to embrace a new approach to how they handled anomalies. From then on, the Foundation's objective became to actively seek out and contain anomalous entities, creatures, objects, and locations like SCP-001. Rather than just observing these phenomena for study, they would secure, contain, and protect. The final portion of SCP-001's file is a memorandum detailing an arrangement between the O5 Council and an unknown counterparty. In the document, someone named Sheldon Katz set out revised terms for the Foundation's continued use of Facility T. Sheldon states that he has reached an understanding with the counterparty, 
and that the contents of the document are to serve as a formal agreement, a contract of sorts between the SCP Foundation and someone else. According to this contract, the incident with Scranton put a strain on the relationship between the Foundation and whoever the counterparty is, and that the O5 Council are seeking to make amends in order to continue their new goal of collecting and containing anomalies. So who was this counterparty that the Overseer Council was so desperate to appease and have on their side? Who could possibly be a higher power than the most powerful secret organization on Earth? Well, an actual higher power, of course. That's right, the O5 Council was making a deal with God over how they were allowed to use his blind spot, or at least a very powerful being that considers itself to be God. The rules laid out on their agreement stated that no person was permitted to stay at the site of SCP-001 for more than 120 years, including members of the O5 Council, along with other members of Foundation staff, management, researchers, security personnel, and test subjects. Additionally, the SCP Foundation's Ethics Committee was required to annually report any and all of the O5 Council's decisions to God. For his own part, God was restricted from smiting or exacting his terrible wrath upon any member of Foundation personnel. That's right, a perk of working for the SCP Foundation is getting around-the-clock divine protection, at least from God himself. That's still a lot better than an employee dental plan. This came with a condition, however, that anyone committing a transgression or mortal sin was given a 90-day written notice and an opportunity to repent their wrongdoing. In return, God demanded that members of the Foundation only worshipped Him and no other divine entities. I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me was written in the contract. Finally, the agreement between the O5 Council and God was that they would work together. The Foundation and the Counterparty would be equal partners when it came to the containment of SCPs and anomalies. Of all the strange and unexplained phenomena that the SCP Foundation encounters on a regular basis, it hardly comes as much of a surprise that they've got a direct line to the big guy upstairs. Or at least one who purports to be. Still, the fact that the O5 Council have a business arrangement with an ultra-powerful deity-like being and express written permission to use his blind spot where no person can die or age is hardly a comforting thought. At least the SCP Foundation only ever uses its power for good, right? The Scarlet King is a really bad guy. He's a giant interdimensional nightmare god, intent on breaching our reality and wrecking terrible havoc on everything we know and love. He's been responsible for untold suffering and chaos across countless worlds, timelines, and layers of reality. To many, he's even somewhat of a final boss to the SCP Foundation. And just when you think he couldn't get any worse, it turns out that he's also a deadbeat dad. Not only did the Scarlet King once have a cult literally named the Children of the Scarlet King, before it was destroyed by Dr. Montauk and the SCP Foundation, he also had at least seven actual children. Each one is speculated to be a powerful anomaly, but it's tough to find concrete answers as to who or what exactly most of them are. So today we're putting on our researcher hats and digging deep into the Foundation's lore to present our theories on the potential progeny of the SCP Foundation's greatest enemy. And if nothing else, we may finally be able to get this Dark Lord of all evil to start paying all the child support he probably owes by now. First, if you're not well versed in Scarlet King lore, you may be wondering, how exactly does an evil Chaos God have kids? Is there a Scarlet Queen out there who prefers to stay out of the limelight? The answer isn't quite that simple, and it has everything to do with SCP-231 and Big Red's most devoted cult, the non-biological children of the Scarlet King. They kidnapped a group of seven girls and performed a number of dark rituals that resulted in them becoming vessels for the Scarlet King's seven terrible kids. These seven girls have become known as SCP-231. Anyone who accesses those files, and trust us, they aren't a pretty sight, will find that the containment procedures mostly involve performing the infamous Montauk procedure on the surviving girls to keep them from giving birth. 
Six of the seven brides have given birth to nightmares beyond comprehension and are now dead, with only one still remaining successfully contained. But here at the SCP Foundation, you need to learn to comprehend the incomprehensible. According to a classified document, SCP-231 may technically be a neutralized anomaly without us even knowing. And incidentally, this gives us our most certain answer on the Children of the Scarlet King. On this one, the apple fell very, very far from the tree. According to the secret document, SCP-999, that's right, the adorable tickle monster, is the seventh child of the Scarlet King. He must be so disappointed that everyone's favorite little blob didn't want to join the family business of absolute evil. For anyone who doesn't know, SCP-999 is a slimy yellow entity that only seems capable of absolute <laughs> compassion. It brings joy to everyone in its presence, and with prolonged exposure it can even cure disorders like PTSD, anxiety, and depression. He's so good at this that he even cured SCP-231-7, his de facto mother, of her trauma, and allowed her to return happily to her family after some amnestic treatment. The Scarlet King has another good reason to be ashamed of his cheerful blobby son. Ancient Davidi prophecy dictates that SCP-999 may someday become so powerful that his force of absolute love and good overwhelms the Scarlet King's evil and chaos. Think of him as the Luke Skywalker to the Scarlet King's Darth Vader, though we probably can't expect a cool lightsaber battle between them anytime soon. How disappointing. So if SCP-999 is the quiet, sensitive black sheep of the Scarlet family, who's the golden child who makes his evil father proud? The real chip off the old block? That would be our dear reptilian friend, SCP-682, the malicious lizard heavily implied to be a child of the Scarlet King. If you know literally anything about 682, your reaction to finding out that he's the spawn of cruelty personified is probably, yeah, that makes sense. Just as SCP-999 is the Scarlet King's innocent, optimistic young child, 682 is kind of like his edgy teenager. Still in the middle of a misanthropic phase, he shows no sign of leaving anytime soon. The fact that 682 appears to find anything about the world around him utterly disgusting seems to be a trait he inherited from his dear old dad. And the fact he seems pretty much impossible to kill also lends credence to the popular theory he's got nightmare god blood running through his veins. Mm -hmm. 682 has also started displaying a particular hatred for 999 ever since an incident where 999 tickled him into submission, so family dinners are probably extra awkward for these two. 999 and 682 are the most certain children, but that still leaves us with five more children to identify. It's worth remembering that the waters are murkier from here on in, but we've searched far and wide through the Foundation archives to find possible answers. If your interpretation differs, remember that it's just a theory, an SCP explained theory. Thankfully, we do have some assistance here. The tale Dust and Blood hinted at what each of the seven children of the Scarlet King represents, and that may help us narrow down our choices here. To put things into perspective, it's believed that 682 was the fourth child to be born, representing wrath, and 999 was the seventh, representing hope. According to this tale, the first of the seven children represents dominion, and as a result, is skilled in the ways of war and has the power to lead the king's forces to victory. According to one Foundation theorist, this child could potentially be SCP-239, also known as the Witch Child. This entity is so powerful that, as part of its normal containment procedures, it's eternally kept in a coma. Why? Because this seemingly normal child has dominion over reality and can change it to her whims. Her thoughts are so powerful that just her brainwaves can damage physical matter, and she can make things disappear or manifest in an instant. She's also impossible to kill, with skin that's almost totally impenetrable. Much like SCP-682, She's also frighteningly strong in both the offense and defense department. We're talking about such a powerful telepath that Dr. Clef has campaigned for her immediate termination, just because it's safer that way. This is certainly a frightening wonderkin that the Scarlet King would be proud to call his daughter. Next, the second child. According to the prophecy, this child represents longing. The child has the power to bring forth armies, which will help the Scarlet King in his conquest. For this, we actually have a pretty unconventional theory. SCP-029, also known as the Daughter of Darkness, 
If the name alone wasn't enough to suggest that she's got an extremely sinister father, she also fits the profile of being very aggressive and incredibly hard to kill. But even more damning is her connections to the symbology of longing. One of her most dangerous powers is causing men to fall into almost trance-like devotion to her. After spending time around her, they're suddenly willing to murder in her honor, strangling their victims in hopes of raising Kali, the Hindu god of destruction, whom has many similarities to the Scarlet King. She certainly fits the bill of someone capable of raising armies in the Dark Lord's name. One strike against our Scarlet King connection theory is that the file states the Daughter of Darkness was first discovered in India, which wouldn't match up with the other information we know to be fact. However, while this is a long shot, given the sensitive nature of everything involving the Scarlet King, it's extremely possible that false information was supplied to bury the connection. Considering the cover-ups and lies involving anomalies like SCP-1000, this certainly isn't an unprecedented move on the part of the Foundation. Next, the third child. This child is associated with all things desolation, implying destruction, fire, ashes, pestilence, and death across the battlefield. When it comes to spreading destruction and death on a mass scale, one particular SCP comes to mind. SCP-058, The Heart of Darkness. This creature has Scarlet King written all over it. It's evil, it's mysterious, it's pretty much impossible to kill, and it causes mass casualties every time it escapes its containment chamber. It causes fires, whips people to death with its razor-sharp tendrils, and sprays highly corrosive acid from its scorpion-like tail. And it's even red. Given that we know for a fact this entity suddenly emerged out of something that's now been expunged from the records in an undisclosed site, it's extremely possible that the entity 058 came from was SCP-231-3. This is a child that the Scarlet King would definitely be proud of, given that it's impossible to reason with and feels solely motivated by causing destruction, misery, and chaos. We can't think of an entity that better suits the desolation moniker than SCP-058. Next, skipping past SCP-682 at number 4, the fifth child of the Scarlet King is associated with the loose concept of lack. The prophecy then goes into more detail, saying that this child is powerful in the ways of magic and is able to use their abilities to cause great destruction. Here we have another unconventional proposal. What if child number five wasn't actually a child, but children? That's because we think this description perfectly fits SCP-1765, the nightmarish reality-warping sisters, who we think may actually be triplets of the Scarlet King's fifth bride. Now hear us out. These are actually some of the most powerful enemies the Foundation has ever attempted to contain and we know nothing about their past before being bound to a few objects by the serpent's hand. These sadistic reality warpers are so devastatingly powerful that the only action the Foundation can take against them is letting them have free reign over the containment site they currently inhabit. All the Foundation can do is hope they never get bored of tormenting the people inside. As we all know, the Scarlet King despises science, progress, and order. So perhaps a perfect punishment for the Foundation in his many eyes is giving them a taste of their own medicine. The sisters, though particularly their ringleader, are a perverse shadow of the Foundation's love of the scientific method. They take these methods and use them for an activity that the Scarlet King finds much more enjoyable, tormenting and killing people. Whenever these crafty triplets set their mind to it, their horrifically powerful magic is able to cause massive devastation just like the prophecy for the fifth bride's offspring dictates. And finally, the sixth child of the Scarlet King. The concept associated with this one is hidden, meaning it can change its face and walk unnoticed through creation. It's also said to have the responsibility of opening the ways between worlds and allowing the war to end all wars to first begin. There have been a huge number of guesses for this spot, with some even suggesting SCP-055, the anti-meme. But since we're having fun here, we also want to make an even wilder suggestion. We posit that the sixth child of the Scarlet King is Allison Chow, also known as LS and the Black Queen, the most powerful member of the Serpent's Hand. We get it, we have a lot of explaining to do, but hear us out. Allison Chow is a member of the Serpent's Hand, or technically many members. 
Multiple versions of her exist across parallel dimensions in the SCP multiverse. They're mostly all estranged daughters of Foundation researcher Dr. Charles Kears. This estrangement leads them to collaborate in the Wanderer's Library, the secret base of the Serpent's Hand, to conduct raids on the Foundation in revenge. But what if the leader of these alternate Allisons had an ulterior motive? Because in the infinite number of possibilities offered by the multiverse, this one was not the daughter of Charles Gears, but the Scarlet King. She's merely using the pain of her counterparts to manipulate them into accomplishing her true father's goal, undermining the SCP Foundation. Let's break it down. The hidden child is prophesized to walk unnoticed through creation. Not only does Allison Chow appear human, the use of SCP-268, a newsboy cap that causes the wearer to become unnoticed, allows her to walk anywhere through creation without being detected. But most importantly of all, the hidden child is said to be the one who opens the way for the Scarlet King's entrance into our dimension. And Allison Chow has access to the Wanderer's Library, an unfettered access point between dimensions. If one of the infinite Allisons was the secret daughter of the Scarlet King, would the Wanderer's Library not be a perfect way for him to leave his own dimension and enter ours? She could be the final piece he needs, hidden under the nose of the Foundation and the Serpent's Hand, making all the secret power plays to allow for the Scarlet King's eventual bloody revenge on our world. Unless, of course, SCP-999, the family disappointment, stops him first. We realize that some of these theories may seem surprising, but when it comes to the anomalous, especially the Scarlet King, the only thing you can ever expect is the unexpected. Do you agree with our theories? If not, who do you think are the children of the Scarlet King? Let us know down in the comments. One thing is for certain. We hope we never meet any of the terrible tyrant's nasty children. Except the Tickle Monster, of course. He can hang with us anytime. The SCP Foundation is no stranger to pure evil. Whether it's a reptile that wants to end all life, a sadistic old man with his own tortured dimension, or the personification of death itself lurking beyond a limestone cavern. But what if there was something even worse out there? The embodiment of chaos and cruelty, existing across multiple realities and dimensions. And what if it was coming for us? This is the Scarlet King, believed by many to be the ultimate evil behind much of the trouble the Foundation has faced, and some even speculate that fighting him was the reason the Foundation was created in the first place. But what exactly is the Scarlet King? He's known by many names, almost always including some allusion to the color red, and then a reference to royalty or power. Harak, Kaharak, the Red Shah, the Crimson Khan, PTE-616 Mendez Ex Machina, the Laha Raja, and, of course, SCP-001, to name a few. And like many of the Foundation's mysterious enemies, stories about his true nature and origins abound and are often contradictory. According to the official SCP-001 files of Tufto's proposal, symbology of the Scarlet King has existed in multiple cultures throughout history, with the king often depicted the same way, as a huge, red, demonic figure, often wearing a gold crown or other headdress indicating royalty. He shows up looking similarly within different cultures' mythologies, despite existing at different points in history or them not having the means to communicate with one another. A number of entities that the SCP Foundation is familiar with are believed to be somehow connected to the Scarlet King, including SCP-2317, a wooden door leading to the realm of a being known as the Devourer, who is expected to escape and cause an apocalyptic event in the next 30 years. But really, there is no way of knowing just how many SCPs are directly connected to the Scarlet King. Strangely, the Foundation's official file on the Scarlet King once designated his containment class as Keter, but that has since been downgraded to safe. According to the file, any attempt to change this designation is likely to lead to horrifying results. It is widely known that the Scarlet King still has considerable influence over a number of groups, individuals, and anomalies in our universe. And if ever he made his way into our universe, 
it would likely lead to the irreversible damage of reality itself. So then why safe? And why are the O5 Council so adamant that it remained that way? Getting to the bottom of this mystery is exactly why we're here today. But to fully grasp the true nature of the Scarlet mm. King, we must first understand the man whose life and fate have always been tied to it, Dr. Robert Montauk. If that name feels oddly familiar to you, it's because of its association with one of the Scarlet King's most recent attempts to enter our reality, SCP-231. This SCP, often referred to as the Brides of the Scarlet King, was formed of seven women. Seven, by the way, being an extremely significant number for the King, all kidnapped by the most recent in a long line of the King's devoted cults known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these seven unfortunate women were impregnated with anomalous horrors, such as the infamous SCP-682, and every time one of these horrors were birthed, a catastrophe occurred and the mother died. At the time, Dr. Montauk was a prominent researcher studying this anomaly, and as six catastrophes had already occurred, pressure was mounting to figure out a way to prevent the final birth. But as he was working on the issue, Dr. Montauk was struck with a personal tragedy, the mysterious disappearance of his 14-year-old brother Jacob. In his fear and anger, Montauk believed that this must have something to do with the Scarlet King and his disciples. Wanting revenge, Montauk proposed an idea so horrifying that the details were never made public, a procedure known as 110 Montauk, to be performed on the final bride at regular intervals. However, this wasn't the end of Dr. Montauk's fraught relationship with the Scarlet King. It was just the beginning. To give you some perspective on just how dangerous the Scarlet King is, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition decided to put aside their differences and form a joint effort to stamp out the children of the Scarlet King. They were successful in this mission, and even managed to capture the children's leader, a mysterious man named Depesh Spivak. Dr. Montauk, who became the lead researcher on 231 and 2317, was naturally the first choice for interviewing Depeche about the true nature of the children and of the Scarlet King. Dr. Montauk could never be the impartial interviewer that the SCP Foundation wanted, though. The suspicion that the Scarlet King or the children had something to do with the loss of his younger brother still lingered just beneath the surface. Like a lot of cult leaders, Depeche was extremely cryptic in his answers to Dr. Montauk's questioning. He'd already heard of the doctor from the reputation of the horrifying Montauk procedure, and was surprised to see him so calm and courteous in person. A few key facts about the king and his cult were revealed in the first few rounds of questioning. The children had once worked with the serpent's hand before being excommunicated for their allegiance to the king and they had stolen sacred texts from the mystical Wanderer's Library to assist in their summoning rituals. Depeche also revealed that the Scarlet King is bound by three laws. The Law of Blood, the Law of Concrete, and the Law of Howling. Dr. Montauk, confused and frustrated by Depeche's secrecy, had to learn more. He found an old memoir from a former member of the Children of the Scarlet King, Jack Hirsch, who had the ability to invade the minds of people from the past and experience what they experienced. He recounted a battle between the Scarlet King and his followers, and a group of time-traveling Turkmen warriors from SCP-3838. Hurst saw both sides of the battle. From the perspective of the Children of the Scarlet King, their lord ruled over them from an immense fortress embedded in a volcano. From the perspective of the Turkmen, the children were starved and beaten peasants, commanded by the king's voice in the roaring howl of the wind. Montauk also found extensive records of summoning rituals performed by various Scarlet King-aligned cults. Interestingly, some of them incorporated the use of carved SCP Foundation symbols. What could this mean? Montauk returned again to Depeche, who finally gave him the truth about the Law of Blood. This is the Law of the Scarlet King. It's defined by poverty, violence, starvation, hate, and most of all, fear. Like the serfs in the Middle Ages, persecuted by and subjected to violence from the nobles. To the children of the Scarlet King, this sense of holy pain and awe is the only way to live. 
The alternative is the law of concrete, which means the modern age defined by empty safety and false comfort. Buildings, easy to access food, healthcare, knowledge, technology. This is everything that the Scarlet King despises. But the mystery only deepened as Montauk found files from a former Foundation operative by the name of Agent de Beauvoir. Montauk learned that the Scarlet King didn't seem to appear until after the Foundation was created. And in fact, it seemed that the greater interest the Foundation took in the Scarlet King, the more powerful he became. How could this be? Things were also getting stranger on a personal level for Dr. Montauk. Depeche repeatedly pressed him about his brother's disappearance and the Montauk procedure during the interviews. Little by little, it was beginning to take its toll. The questions still plagued him. What was the law of howling? Who or what really is the Scarlet King? How did he come to be? Montauk's search was causing him to act more like the children of the Scarlet King, ranting about the horrors of the modern world how all of us are living a lie, how the only honest way to live is suffering under the dominion of the Scarlet King. This philosophy is summed up in the words of one cultist named Arya Dene Cartwright, who said, We must learn what it is to die, to be enslaved, truly, brutally enslaved, with no compassion or compunction from our masters. We must learn what it is to be taken towards a single purpose, to know and truly understand our lack of agency. We must be beholden to the words of gods and darkness, the tempest-tossed refuse of a race of fools. We must kill modernity, postmodernity, with all its analysis and sneering observation. There is only one rule, the rule of chaos, for humanity, for life, for the Scarlet King. Basically, any time humanity tries to exert control over the world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. Every time they try to understand or organize or categorize their world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. As colonial and imperial powers conquered and invaded lands like India, Africa, and South America, and subjugated their beliefs under Western ideas, the Scarlet King grew stronger. Montauk was beginning to truly understand the power of his enemy here. And even worse, he was starting to understand his part in it. Montauk, slowly being driven mad by the knowledge he was gaining, realized that the Scarlet King's greatest enemy, the SCP Foundation, was also its greatest asset. Every time they tried to understand the monster, to give him some kind of comprehensible form, they only made him more powerful. Just in time with Montauk's new revelation, a red crack appeared in the wall of Depeche Spivak's containment cell, a portal to the realm of the Scarlet King. Foundation staff found they were unable to enter the cell, and Depeche demanded a final interview with Montauk. With no other options, the Foundation relented. In their very last conversation, Depeche congratulated Montauk for finally understanding what he was dealing with. The Scarlet King, Depeche told him, is an idea, a concept. He is a being given power through the conflict between the old and the new. This is the law of the howling. The Scarlet King's endless rage at the direction the world and humanity has taken. The King, according to Depeche, hated the Foundation's belief that science and rationality was the true path to progress. The king saw this as little more than petty arrogance. The reason Montauk's procedure on the final bride of the Scarlet King was so effective was because it wasn't born out of science. It was born out of hate, pain, the desire for revenge. And in the Scarlet King's realm, that would be all there is. Unless our world, and especially the Foundation, changed its course, the Scarlet King's rise to absolute power would be inevitable. Montauk, his mind practically gone, asked one last question. Did the children or the Scarlet King take his brother, Jacob? When Depeche told him the answer, no. And in response, Montauk shot him dead, finally bringing an end to the children of the Scarlet King. In light of his new revelations, Montauk begged the O5 Council to change their ways in order to avoid letting the Scarlet King break into our reality. 
They refused, saying Montauk's ideas were too radical. But they knew they couldn't just ignore the threat posed by the Scarlet King. They would have to take some steps. And so the O5 Council of the SCP Foundation, the most powerful and secretive group in the entire world, in order to prevent the most dangerous threat that humanity has ever known from breaking into our reality and enslaving all the people of the world, finally did something. They changed the classification of the Scarlet King from Keter to safe, and made its description on the official Foundation files deliberately vague. The O5 Council thinks this will be enough to stop the Scarlet King's power from continuing to grow, but Montauk knew it wasn't enough. He had seen the truth, and he couldn't unsee it. While the Foundation was going on as normal, Montauk grew to despise them. He knew the Scarlet King was coming, he knew that he couldn't be stopped and that our whole reality was little more than sitting ducks. Dr. Robert Montauk is no longer a researcher for the SCP Foundation. No, Dr. Robert Montauk chose a different path. He's now a child of the Scarlet King, a devotee of madness, hate, and chaos. You can't beat the Scarlet King after all, and as the old adage goes, if you can't beat him, join him. Any changes today? The younger security officer, Zack, asked as he stepped into the watchtower. As if, replied his superior, a jaded, cynical old man who insisted on being referred to as Mr. Jefferson. The darn thing hasn't moved, spoken, or done so much as stretch one of those wings of his. Another day at the office, then, Zack jumped. Through the window, the pair of them looked through at the towering figure a few kilometers away. SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, stood motionless, its fiery sword in its hand, ever protecting its post at the precipice between our world and paradise. It had long been stationed at the entrance of a dimensional gateway that led to what was believed to be the Garden of Eden, described in the Biblical Old Testament. Much like the security officers in the Foundation's base tasked with watching the Guardian, this was pretty much the extent of the day's activities. Hey, did you see that news about the uh, transfer posting? Zack asked, trying to stave off boredom with as much conversation he could squeeze out of his fellow officer. Yeah, I saw it. Mr. Jefferson scoffed, rolling his eyes. What possesses someone like Robert Montauk to come down here? Eh, must have wanted a quieter post, Zack reasoned, looking out at the stillness of the Gate Guardian. Won't find one any quieter than here, Jefferson mused. Him showing up will be the most exciting thing that's happened here in a long while. Unbeknownst to both Zack and Mr. Jefferson, Dr. Robert Montauk would be only joining the team at the Gate Guardian observation site for a short while. Not one of them, nor anybody else within the Foundation, could ever guess Montauk's true intentions behind venturing there in the first place. He wanted an audience with the Gate Guardian itself. Approaching the colossal thousand-foot-tall being, Dr. Montauk crossed the threshold of the minimum safe distance from the Guardian. Given the sheer heat of its weapon, hotter than Earth's sun, anything within a kilometer of SCP-001 was at risk of being obliterated, vaporized into atoms if they didn't turn back. Which, through a voice that immediately rang out in Montauk's ears, the Gate Guardian commanded him to do. Leave. Its psychic message boomed. Wait, wait, Dr. Montauk urged, holding up his hands in what would have been a futile defense against the Guardian Sword. I know what you do when people don't listen to your commands, but please, just give me a minute. There was silence. SCP-001 didn't reply. There was nobody else close enough to hear Montauk speak to it. So, he continued. You are impossibly old. We know that much about you. And because of that, you must have seen things that we can't even begin to imagine, much less fully comprehend. But I've come a very long way to request that you impart some information to me, if you can." He paused again, as if waiting for a reply that never came. The Gate Guardian merely stood in the same defensive, unwavering stance. Tell me, please, how much do you know about the Scarlet King? By this point in time, although the Foundation was yet to realize, Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly going insane. His investigations into an anomalous entity known as the Scarlet King were gradually corrupting him, as he tried relentlessly to quantify exactly what this entity was and how great of a threat it posed. 
Little did Montauk realize that, in trying so hard to define and comprehend the being, he was inadvertently fueling its power. The Scarlet King was an interdimensional warmonger, an embodiment of hatred and chaos, and Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly falling under the King's influence. Upon hearing the tiny human figure utter his question, the immense gate guardian rebuted with another single word psychic command, one it had never been recorded giving before. Witness! As if his increasing instability and the creeping influence of the Scarlet King hadn't made Montauk feel bad enough, he instantly felt sick. There was a searing pain behind his eyes, like he was staring directly at the sun, accompanied by a nausea that made his head spin. It took a moment of enduring the horrific sensation before he realized what was happening. The Guardian was trying to show him something. Rather than give any information on the Scarlet King verbally, SCP-001 was imparting a psychic vision onto Montauk, a memory of events long past, the answers he sought, a warning, or perhaps all three. The vision showed Montauk a time so long ago that it couldn't ever be forgotten, for there was barely anyone alive to remember it in the first place. It was eons in the past, long before the comparatively recent dawn of humanity, a time only spoken of in the Dust and Blood Tablet an artifact of the Davite civilization, some of the earliest worshippers of the Scarlet King himself. And there, marching up to the entrance of Eden, was the crimson-clad Eldritch Abomination and a horde of horrors with him. According to the story recorded in the Dust and Blood Tablet, this would have been much earlier in the life of the Scarlet King, perhaps even before he assumed his now infamous title. Back then, he would most likely have been known as his original name of Kanthrak, one of multiple siblings born when the Tree of Life was planted, and thus created all life in the multiverse. But, being the only one of his siblings cursed with awareness, knowing the pain his existence brought him, Kamhrak would eventually set out on his lifelong mission to destroy all of existence across every dimension. And he started by killing his siblings, consuming them to claim their power for himself. Around this time in prehistory, the being that would one day become known as Scarlet King didn't quite possess the power that he would several millennia later. Although that's not to say he was an unformidable force of destruction, fueled by his singular hatred for existence. His vow to destroy extended to the Tree of Life that had caused him to be, along with the tree's creator and all of their creation. In other words, everything in the multiverse, all of creation, if you will. So what was the Scarlet King doing there so long ago, at the dimensional doorway protected by the Gate Guardian? Well, beyond the boundary, between it and the rest of the infinite multiverse, lay the supposed Garden of Eden. While it is unknown if it is, in fact, the same Eden referred to in the Book of Genesis is up for debate, especially among the Foundation. But at a glance, even through the gate, it certainly does look like a paradise. The space is filled with lush vegetation of astronomical size, populated by a number of beings that seem to resemble the Gate Guardian itself. And there, protected by its watchful caretaker, are two trees. One is thought to be the Tree of Knowledge, that Eve was tricked into eating an apple from during the Book of Genesis. The other, however, bears an unknown type of fruit, and is widely believed to be the Tree of Life. Now back in the modern age, there's never been a conclusive link between the Tree of Life mentioned by the Davites and their barbaric civilization's legends regarding the creation of the Scarlet King, but the fact that so long ago he and his most feared generals were bearing down on the Gate Guardian's position, defending a garden where there was known to be a tree of that description, well, it all seems rather conclusive now. Alongside Kahrarak were six of his seven daughters, each one of them a fearsome abomination much like their destructive father. As they approached, not one needed to exchange any words with their angelic protector of Eden. The Gate Guardian knew what these monsters were here for. They would stop at nothing to pass through his gate and uproot the Tree of Life, 
the progenitor of all living beings in all of existence. Even though it was early in Kathrak's career as the rampaging interdimensional warlord he so is, he was as steadfast as ever in his goal to annihilate every corner of creation, every dimension, every parallel plane of reality, every single pocket of existence across infinity. They'd all come undone if he burned the Tree of Life, pulled it out at the roots, and splintered it until nothing remained. To the once and future Scarlet King, that the same tree had led to his own tortured existence. It was the source of his suffering, and it had to be destroyed. The only thing standing in his way was a figure as colossal as Kamrak himself, wielding a flaming sword. Leave! Boomed the psychic voice of the Gate Guardian. It was like a doorman standing before a group of rowdy teenagers trying to force their way into a movie theater. Except these rowdy teens were the Scarlet King, his horrifying daughters, and the forces he had already amassed since his creation. The Horde stood ready, waiting for the commands of their king, who they thought would gladly lead the charge as they marched on the Garden of Eden to begin the destruction of existence. But that's not what happened. Usually, the Scarlet King would never shy away from a fight, preferring to lead the charge when it came to a slaughter. Instead, he commanded his first daughter, Atibet, to commence the first attack on the protector who stood in their path. On her foul father's word, Ativik took her horde and charged at the Guardian. What she and her forces lacked in numerical advantage, Ativik more than made up for in her knowledge of war. She hungered for it, sought dominion. That was her seal, after all. And yet, in the face of this impending onslaught, the Gate Guardian remained still, rooted to the same spot it had as always, and would always be standing in. A number of Ativik's minions burst into flames, the very fabric of their crude form separated on a molecular level as they were effortlessly rendered into nothingness. Still, the Gate Guardian hadn't appeared to move an inch, had exerted no energy, despite the damage it had done to Ativik and her forces in defense of Eden. As his first daughter screeched and howled in despair at the decimation of her horde, her children, the Scarlet King decided he needed to better understand his opponent. With a wave of his clawed crimson hand, the King commanded his next daughter, Aghor, to send forth her own army. In a tidal wave of nightmarish creatures, Aghor sent her horrific children into battle. She possessed a far greater quantity to do battle on her father's behalf. Perhaps Aghor even believed that was the Scarlet King's plan. With a greater number of her forces over her sisters, maybe she would be able to overwhelm the Guardian. But even as her own children began to be vaporized the closer that they got to the gate, Aghor had no idea she was little more than a pawn being sacrificed so that Kanra could learn more about his imposing angelic enemy. Another of the Scarlet King's daughters, a being known as Anhwit, was the next called up to contribute to the unfolding battle. Although, to call it a battle undersells just how easily the Gate Guardian seemed to be eliminating the oncoming forces without even moving. While an outwardly frail-seeming creature, Anhuit's primary strength over her sisters was a proficiency in magic, her innate ability to warp and reshape reality around her. It was that power that had caused her father to be wary of her, viewing Anhuit's abilities as a threat to his leadership. And so, Kantrak had her crippled and all her children, leaving them unable to overthrow him, but still loyal to their king. Obeying her father's command, perhaps out of the same loyalty or fear that he would harm her and her children further if she disobeyed, Anhuit unfurled her magic. She reshaped the world around them, making it so that the passage of time moved so much slower. And that was what revealed to the Scarlet King his enemy's greatest strength in combat. The Gate Guardian had so far been able to obliterate both Ativik and now Akhor's forces without seeming to move, but it wasn't by standing still. It was moving, just much faster than the blink of Scarlet King's multiple eyes. Now that Anhuit's magic had slowed the passage of time, the Gate Guardian could be seen doing battle. As Akhor's atrocities spilled towards the Angel to try and overwhelm it, it effortlessly blocked the oncoming attacks with its sword. Everything the Flaming Blade connected with instantly evaporated, bursting into atoms as they were practically cleaved out of existence by the Gate Guardian's mighty weapon. Even with time slowed to a crawl, the towering Winged Protector of Eden only appeared to be moving at an average speed. But when time flowed normally, without Anhuit manipulating reality, the Guardian was simply too fast to be observed. 
Resisting the urge to dive headfirst into the fight himself, the Scarlet King knew it would likely lead to his untimely demise. He refused to accept that. It could not happen. But he still had yet to amass the strength he would need as he continued his ascent. So while time was slowed to a crawl and the Gate Guardian was still engaged in combat with Aghoros forces, he turned to another of his remaining daughters, Adista. If the Scarlet King and his forces couldn't get past the Guardian, they could still try to get to the Tree of Life while the Protector's focus was diverted. Adistan unleashed a wave of pestilence, sickness, and disease spewing from her in a cloud of vapor, heading straight towards the Angelic Garden and Eden's entrance beyond. The Scarlet King knew this latest attack wouldn't phase or weaken the Gate Guardian. He hoped the foul smog would instead pass through the gateway itself into the garden. As Adisat sent forth her power, blood and ash soaked the landscape around them. All the plants outside the entrance to Eden withered and died, shriveling and decomposing as the disgusting fog rolled towards the gate. It washed over the Guardian, whose form only seemed to glow brighter as he repelled the pestilence. It was as if it didn't even need to think about it, still focused on finishing off the rest of the oncoming army. As its glow intensified, so did the fiery sword that the Gate Guardian swung with ease and finesse. Flames burst from the blade, the encroaching fumes catching fire along with the air itself. It ignited in a wave of fire, a defensive inferno that repelled this latest attack. But for a brief few moments, while time stayed slow, before Anhuit's hold on reality inevitably broke, the king had sent forth Atilif. Of all his spawn, she was the most reserved, keeping mostly to herself, never speaking. She and her children could change their faces and forms, shift into anything or anyone, and walk undetected through the multiverse. And now her father was employing her incredible stealth abilities to slip behind enemy lines, while the Gate Guardian was finishing off the remaining onslaught from Kanhrak's other daughters. It was as Atilif drew near, creeping unseen closer and closer to the entrance, keeping the Scarlet King out of Eden, that the Guardian seemed to pause. It slowly, ominously turned its huge head, tilting until it was looking directly at Atilif. If its expression could be seen, maybe the Gate Guardian would almost be impressed that someone was able to sneak past it. After all, it was a feat that no other being in creation could ever hope to accomplish. But then again, with its steadfast conviction and dedication to its protective duty, maybe it would have looked upon Atilif with anger. With a cleaving swing of its scorching sword, the Gate Guardian unfurled a tidal wave of fire that engulfed everything around it. Not just Atilif, but Ativik, Aghor, and Adista, all the king's daughters that had attacked so far, along with every one of their own children, were instantly obliterated. They were all reduced to empty, vacant spaces where they had once been, their atoms separated by the searing swing of the Guardian's weapon. The devastating blow by his adversary did little to deter the Scarlet King from his mission. He was still set on destroying the Tree of Life, and no loss was too great in his pursuit of destroying existence. He barely cared that four of his own daughters had just been unmade by the Guardian. Anhuit was still there, clinging on to time as if it were a thrashing animal. The Scarlet King could simply make her restore her fallen sisters and their forces. He had lost nothing, but had held back for too long, and slowly drew his own weapon out of thin air. Wielding a sword that was as blood-soaked as the Guardian's was hot, the Scarlet King locked blades with the one being standing in their way. Both the ancient Angelic Defender and the attacking Eldritch Abomination were evenly matched. Every one of their vicious strikes against the other met with an equally strong parry. A weapon of extreme, all-consuming heat blocked swipes from a sharp, serrated edge that matched the deep red that would be forever synonymous with Kankrak. The force of their two swords clashing and striking each other was so great that it rippled out from their one-on-one -on -one fight. The landscape around them was flattened wiped clean of any remaining plant life that hadn't already been destroyed by the forces of the king's daughters. Despite having acquired nowhere near the power he would thousands of years after this fight, the Scarlet King was still a formidable force in single combat, and yet the Gate Guardian seemed incapable of tiring or weakening, still standing strong against the onslaught. 
Even after wiping multiple armies out with its flaming sword, the Guardian was still able to hold its own against the Scarlet King, who was furious. Enraged at being so close to the Tree of Life, yet unable to get past his angelic adversary. He'd need to be stronger, faster, even more ruthless than the warlord he already was. Despite Anhuit slowing down time, the King and the Guardian were at a stalemate. Time. That was it. The Scarlet King needed more time. Withdrawing from the fight, he realized that this was a battle that could not be won by sheer brute force alone. His mission to destroy all creation, to get to the Tree of Life, would take cunning, deception, and more time. If he let it, the Gate Guardian could easily kill Kantra. Its flaming weapon could cleave him out of existence, and that would end the King's torment. But it wouldn't be enough. A death would be unsatisfying knowing that the rest of existence would go on after he was gone. The Scarlet King couldn't accept that. It wasn't enough. So he did the one thing nobody would expect of him. He made a deal with the Gate Guardian. It was an action still fueled by his infinite hatred for all existence, his yearning for total chaos. The Scarlet King knew that one day, an event would arrive where the Guardian and the other beings like it in the Garden of Eden would spill forth and deliver judgment on this world. And when that rapture happened, the Tree of Life would be undefended. The Scarlet King bartered with the Guardian that he would retreat for the time being so he could spend eons amassing more and more power. Then, when the fateful day arrived, the Gate Guardian would allow him into Eden to destroy the Tree of Life, while it and its brethren were busy conducting the Rapture. Halting their fight, the Scarlet King offered a Crimson Claw to the Gate Guardian's burning hand. Returning to reality from the intense vision, still feeling sick at what he had witnessed, Robert Montauk looked up at the still, silent form of the Gate Guardian. Did you do it? He yelled, desperate to know more through his obsession with the Scarlet King. Did you tell him yes? Did you make a deal? There was no answer from the Guardian, just a single word that echoed through Montauk's fractured mind. Leave. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, which is the part of the Old Testament that details God creating the world and humanity during a particularly busy week, then you might just be already familiar with SCP-001, or at least one of the anomalies that's been proposed for the title of SCP-001. Because of course, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all of creation that is thought by Foundation researchers to be one of the most dangerous beings in this and any other universe. But the Scarlet King isn't the only incredibly powerful being categorized as SCP-001. In fact, there are plenty of other anomalies with similar levels of destructive power. And one such being is a creature codenamed the Gate Guardian. Standing at well over a thousand feet tall, the Gate Guardian is impossible to be fully contained by any means that the Foundation possesses. The anomaly itself, despite its colossal size, is humanoid in its shape, sporting wings that protrude from its back. While it usually has four of these, SCP-001 has historically been seen to have any number of wings between 2 and 108, sprouting from various places over its body including its shoulders, ankles, wrists, and even its temples. This gigantic guardian also carries its own weapon, referred to as SCP-001-2. This weapon resembles an enormous knife or sword capable of emitting plumes of flame. According to tests conducted by the Foundation, the temperature of the flames produced by SCP-001 rival that of our very own sun. For reference, the sun has a core temperature of over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and 5,778 Kelvin at its surface, or almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You would expect a flaming sword that burns hotter than the sun to cause a considerable amount of damage, even if it wasn't in use, but the flames emitted by the weapon leave no lasting damage on the surrounding environment. It is capable, though, of annihilating anything that strays too close to SCP-001, burning them so intensely that their atoms literally separate 
breaking potential attackers apart on a molecular level. Much as its codename suggests, the Gate Guardian stands solemnly at the threshold of some form of dimensional gateway, which is equally tall as SCP-001 itself. Behind the Guardian is a lush grove, abundant with fruit trees of astronomical size, as well as other beings that share a similar appearance to SCP-001. This grove is thought to be the Garden of Eden, the paradise that God created and that was inhabited by Adam and Eve, the first two humans in existence, according to the Book of Genesis. As the tale goes, the pair were created by God himself, and permitted to live in the Garden of Eden as long as they followed a single rule. Adam and Eve were instructed not to eat any of the fruit that grew from certain trees that God had specified. Within view just behind the Gate Guardian are two immense trees, one bearing apples and the other bearing different fruit of an unknown type. The one that looks like an apple tree is believed, even by some in the Foundation, to be the biblical tree of knowledge that Eve was convinced to pick a fateful apple from after an encounter with a snake. The other, the one with unidentifiable fruit, is thought to be the tree of life. However, this is all speculation, since it is currently impossible to venture through this gateway and verify if the realm beyond is truly the Bible's own Garden of Eden. This is largely because anything that breaches a kilometer-wide radius of SCP-001 is instantly vaporized. The Gate Guardian attacks with imperceptible speed, using its flaming sword to smite any person that gets too close. The Guardian actually moves so fast that it can hardly be seen with the naked eye. It appears to always remain in its solemn, dutiful stance with its weapon drawn and head bowed, only shifting for a fraction of a nanosecond to attack. Ranged attacks against the Guardian are just as ineffective, with all projectiles fired at SCP-001 reduced to atoms before they can do any harm. Even if said projectile happens to be a nuclear weapon, the Gate Guardian will be able to subatomically vaporize both the projectile itself as well as the person who sent it, regardless of how far away they are, all while not appearing to lift a finger. During an experiment involving SCP-001, on December 26, 2004, an SCP Foundation nuclear submarine called Nautilus launched a series of multi-warhead intercontinental ballistic missiles at the Gate Guardian. The retaliation from the Guardian resulted not only in the deaths of approximately 35,000 innocent civilians, but the blast is also believed by some to have inadvertently caused the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. The severity of this incident came dangerously close to revealing the Foundation's existence to the world, resulting in them rapidly deploying any means necessary to erase any trace of the 35,000 victims' families, friends, and other related individuals. In order to avoid questioning, the SCP Foundation administered amnestics on an almost worldwide scale and the O5 Council banned any further tests on SCP-001 that involved nuclear weapons. In what was hoped by the Foundation to be a test with lower stakes, they sent an expendable D-Class personnel towards SCP-001. The D-Class approached the area where the Gate Guardian is located, and as soon as they saw it, they could hear a very clear command in their mind. Leave. The D-Class personnel reacted exactly the same way you or I would. They promptly turned and started to walk away. They didn't need a thousand-foot-tall entity with a flaming sword to tell them twice. The researchers running the experiment were not swayed by the request, and ordered the D-Class to continue moving towards SCP-001. When the D-Class continued to ignore their commands, they were terminated as is standard policy when dealing with an insubordinate member of D-Class. SCP-001 appeared not to like this for some reason, though, and the researcher site as well as the researchers themselves were immediately obliterated by an unknown force, though it's a pretty safe guess that a certain flaming weapon was responsible. This candidate for SCP-001 may be one of, if not the most powerful being that the SCP Foundation has ever encountered. And according to its entry in the SCP-001 file, the Guardian is even responsible for the creation of the Foundation itself. If the file is to be believed, the administrator of the SCP Foundation one day heard a word echoing through his head. Prepare. 
This one-word instruction led him to starting the SCP Foundation, containing countless dangerous anomalies and entities in preparation for an uncertain future. In all that time, since the very beginning of the Foundation, the Gate Guardian has remained standing at its post. While it is not aggressive nor openly hostile towards humanity, the Gate Guardian doesn't seem to care much for us either, at least as individuals. It rarely interacts with human beings when left unprovoked. And venturing too close to the Guardian, however, is not an automatic death sentence. The Guardian first communicates with any living being approaching it via a telepathic message, instructing them to either leave or forget. If whomever has stepped too close to SCP-001 complies with the instructions, they'll be able to freely leave the area, while simultaneously forgetting every detail of the Gate Guardian's existence. Ignore these warnings, though, and SCP-001 has no qualms about completely eliminating you from reality. Given its enormous destructive potential, it is no wonder that the Foundation has tried to use the Gate Guardian to eliminate other dangerous SCPs, each with varying results. The Foundation at one time even attempted to use the Gate Guardian to destroy the infamously indestructible SCP-682, better known by the appropriate name of the hard-to-destroy reptile. Due to the malicious contempt SCP-682 holds for human beings and all other forms of life, it is perhaps one of the most dangerous anomalies the SCP Foundation has in containment. SCP-682 is also one of the few creatures the Foundation actively wants to terminate, a task made that much harder given that 682 can regenerate its entire form from as little as a single cell. The Gate Guardian had already shown time and time again that it was capable of massive destruction, and researchers working for the Foundation hoped to harness that power to rid the world of SCP-682 for good. 682 was placed on an unmanned vehicle and carried to within one kilometer of the Gate Guardian. The Guardian attacked the vehicle, seriously wounding but not killing 682. It seemed even the mighty SCP-001 couldn't kill the hard-to-destroy reptile. While the researchers were disappointed with this result, it is worth noting that 682 made a very interesting comment to the Guardian. 682 mentioned that the Gate Guardian is not Uriel, but a pretender. Uriel is the archangel that some religious texts describe as the Guardian standing at the Gate of Eden with a fiery sword. So does this mean that 682 knows that the Gate Guardian is not actually an angel? Or that the location it is guarding isn't the Garden of Eden at all? Any truth or meaning behind these comments has, as of yet, been undetermined by the SCP Foundation. A later experiment involved both SCP-001 and SCP-073, the anomaly otherwise known as Cain. Cain is a male humanoid of possible Arabic descent whose arms, legs, spine, and shoulders are replaced in an almost cyborg-like fashion with beryllium bronze, much like the Gate Guardian. SCP-073 may also be the same as the one mentioned in the Bible's book of Genesis, who, according to the biblical story, murdered his own brother Abel out of spite. As punishment for his actions, Cain was cursed to eternally suffer for his wrongdoing. In the case of SCP-073, any damage inflicted on him is deflected back to the attacker, but Cain is made to feel the pain of the attack. Any plants or plant-based matter withers and rots in his presence, and he is cursed with a perfect memory, keeping him forever haunted by his murder of Abel. When Cain was brought before the Gate Guardian, an unknown incident occurred. The Foundation's records are heavily expunged, but we do know that somehow Cain's usual ability to deflect incoming damage back at his attacker had no effect on SCP-001. The encounter left SCP-073 unconscious and even permanently blinded nearby research personnel. It was as a direct result of this incident that the O5 Council demanded that no further experiments of any kind were to be conducted on SCP-001, with the administrator even filing an executive order that no SCPs be exposed to the Guardian, and that SCP-001 was to never be used for the attempted termination of other SCPs. Of course, perhaps it wasn't just the mistakes of the past that made the Council decide that SCP-001 was best left alone. At some point, an erratic transmission was received from Site-0 by Foundation personnel, detailing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. 
In the transmission, the sender, believed to be another member of the SCP Foundation, described an event during which the Gate Guardian finally left its post, stepping away from the entrance to the Garden of Eden. SCP-001 has left its location, the sender wrote. The gate is open. They are riding forth. Oh God, it's so beautiful. The transmission then goes on to repeat various phrases including, The Lord shall reign forever, and hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What can be inferred from the rambling transmission is that the event being described is the end of the world. Some believe that once God deems it time, his angelic armies will lay waste to the earth in order to remake it as a paradise. When this occurs, SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, will open the gate he stands in front of, allowing the other beings like it to emerge into our world, ready to cleanse it. Perhaps most interesting is the source of the message. The transmission was received from within the Foundation from Site Zero. However, when questioned by personnel, O5-14 told them that no such message had been sent or even existed. While some disregarded the transmission telling of the end of the world as a hoax, it was then that a timestamp was discovered. This warning had not been sent from Site Zero, at least not yet, and was dated several years in the future. Despite this ominous warning of things to come, the Gate Guardian remains inactive, standing at the threshold to Eden, waiting. The desert is still. The night seems endless, silent, and at peace, until it's pierced by the sound of gunshots and screams. Deep in the Sahara, the SCP Foundation is waging war against a newly discovered enemy. A squad of Foundation agents is retreating, trying to get away from the ones who massacred their allies. They were attempting to eliminate the threat using conventional means, but their rifles were no match for the reality-bending entities of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The retreating agents cover one another as they make their way back to the extraction point. The enemy force advances. Agents that are caught too close to the sorcerers of Abaddon disintegrate into thin air. This is not an enemy they can defeat. The SCP agents need to get back to base and relay what they have found to their superiors. Out of the hundreds of agents sent into the Sahara that night, only a handful make it out alive. They are debriefed by their superiors at the Foundation who classify the anomalous humanoids under the highest of threat levels. The Kingdom of Abaddon is a threat. The Kingdom of Abaddon must be eliminated. Reconnaissance done prior to the disastrous mission had alerted the Foundation to the presence of anomalies in the region, but they had no idea how strong the anomalous humanoids would be. From data gathered through old reports, it seemed like the Abaddon humanoids were responsible for the deaths of no fewer than 75 Foundation personnel, and had stolen at least 12 different items from the Foundation. The leaders of the SCP Foundation tasked research team Omega-5 with developing a weapon that would be capable of destroying the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. The weapon they are researching must be capable of long-range destruction, because the moment any Foundation agent gets close to the area, they are vaporized by the reality-manipulating powers of its inhabitants. The project is given the name Twins of God, and is led by a Foundation doctor known only by the designation O51. O51 is popular in the SCP Foundation, well known for his in-depth research and charismatic personality, making him the perfect person to lead such a project. And O51 recently came across an anomaly that he believes holds the solution the Foundation has been looking for to defeat the Kingdom of Abaddon. Item 001. And so the Omega-5 team gets to work. They discover that the anomaly has incredible powers when put inside a host, which they refer to as an Item 001 entity, and set up a series of experiments using different people to harness its energy. The first series of tests all end in tragedy. The anomaly causes the entity it inhabits to become intensely radioactive. Anyone who gets close to it succumbs to immediate radiation sickness, and eventually, death. To stop the radiation problems, the Omega-5 research group intensifies the containment procedures. O-51 receives reports from the higher-ups that the Kingdom of Abaddon has attacked another Foundation facility in Sudan. Long-range defense is needed ASAP. The administrator puts more pressure on Omega-5, and especially its leader O-51 to solve the problems of Item 001, 
and develop a weapon that can save the Foundation. He stays awake for days on end, working tirelessly to create a safe and controllable Item 001 entity. Although there are signs that the weapon will work, it is still unpredictable. <gasps> when Item 001 is initiated, the host entity becomes paralyzed, suffers severe cerebral hemorrhaging, and soon a new host is needed before testing can begin again. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong. Whenever the anomaly is put into a new host, sudden and random destruction of on-site structures and personnel take place. O51 knows, though, that if this power can be harnessed and controlled in the right way, that it could be the weapon that the Foundation needs to wipe out the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. In order to control item 001, O51 has a mind kill switch implanted in its host's brains. O51 can activate the implant to incapacitate its host and immediately stop the unwanted destruction. Countless hosts are terminated by this mind kill switch in the early trials conducted by the Omega-5 team, but progress continues to be made, and eventually a hypothesis is formulated. Perhaps the disastrous side effects of item 001 can be offset by spreading the anomaly across multiple subjects. They theorize that the immense mental load of the anomaly can be distributed among several hosts, thus reducing the toil it takes on each and giving them the ability to control its immense power. But O51 and the Omega-5 team need more data, and for that, they need more bodies. They consult with the director of Site-17, and it is concluded that the nearby town of San Marco would be an appropriate place to get the additional test subjects they require. On a quiet Sunday morning, Omega-5, along with support from a squad of armed SCP agents, storm into the San Marcos de la Vida Sterna church during the middle of Mass. They gather up a number of the younger congregants and bring them back to the site where item 001 is housed. The researchers quickly ran through their new supply of test subjects, though, and Omega-5 would need to get even more if their research was to continue. Instead of going back and forth between the testing facility and San Marcos, O51 decided to move the entire item 001 operation to the town itself. He renames the town Testing Site 001, and Omega-5 rounds up 23 of the healthiest subjects they can find for use in the next series of research yeah. tests. A few weeks after occupying the town of San Marco, Omega-5 makes its most substantial progress yet. Just as they theorized, by spreading out the anomaly of item 001 across a specific group of hosts, they can control its powers. The test may have cost the lives of almost everyone in the town, but the ends certainly justify the means. The Kingdom of Abaddon poses an existential threat to the SCP Foundation, after all, and thanks to this research, they will soon have a weapon capable of bringing them victory. The Foundation Administer criticized O51's methods, but can't argue with his results. Unfortunately, O51 has a dark secret, a secret that disturbs even the most hardened and loyal members of Omega-5 a secret that has to do with the item 001 hosts. The hosts that Omega-5 has made its major progress with are not the ordinary test subjects normally used by the Foundation. No, the test subjects O51 makes his breakthrough with are children, nine of them to be exact, all between four and 11 years old. Despite being told specifically by the Foundation Administrator to only test on adults, the research required O51 to break the chain of command and follow the science down the path it led. The children are contained in a reinforced bunker where only O51 and a select few have access. They are technically alive, but are functionally brain dead. The group of nine children share a hive mind that can process information, and more importantly, can unleash the full potential of the implanted anomaly, creating and controlling a devastating power but not everyone is thrilled with what they've achieved. Members of Omega-5 are haunted by the screams of the children that they force to be part of their weapons development program. They describe their merging with item 001 as being a process that rips out their souls and replaces them with something much more sinister. In fact, all of Omega-5 regret what they have been a part of and what they've done, all except 051. The nine children can channel unprecedented amounts of energy from an unknown origin that Omega-5 hypothesizes comes from an extra-dimensional source, which is then used to unbind atoms at the quantum level. When the right activation words are spoken, it appears as though this tremendous power gives the children the ability to annihilate anything in the entire universe. It's a gun to end all guns, and only O51 has the key to control it. 
The Nine Children works so well with an item 001 that Omega-5 reclassifies it to include the Nine Children themselves. They are not just the entity housing or controlling item 001, they permanently become item 001. Once Omega-5 has a better understanding of item 001, they begin to run tests to find out the full extent of its abilities. First, they test the distance item 001 can reach. The initial test that Omega-5 carries out is on a steel rod placed 5 kilometers away. 051 orders the children to destroy the target. Moments later, the phone next to 051 begins to ring. When he picks it up, the observer tasked with watching the pole is on the other end. He informs 051 that the steel rod has been completely vaporized. 051 is not satisfied though. He has another pole sent out, this time placed 8,000 kilometers away from the nine children. 051 asks the children to destroy that rod. Almost immediately, the phone rings again. The target has been vaporized. 051 smiles. The next series of tests Omega-5 runs on item 001 are to determine the maximum size of an object that can be destroyed. The tests start out with a steel sphere, 3 meters in diameter, placed 1,000 kilometers from item 001. 051 orders the children to destroy the object. It is instantly vaporized. 051 has seen enough small tests. It's time for something big. So he does something that will later be questioned by everyone at the SCP Foundation. He orders the nine children to destroy a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey. Not long after the destruction order is given to item 001, reports begin coming in. The worship site has been obliterated with no observable damage to the surrounding area. Deadly and precise. 051 closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He looks as if he's overcome by an immense spiritual experience. He opens his eyes, leans over to the children, and whispers the name of someone. Later that day, 051 finds out that the target he had named has been vaporized. The success of Omega-5 in Item 001 is relayed to the administration of the Foundation. They are so impressed that they make plans to use Item 001 to eliminate the Abaddon threat once and for all. However, one of the heads of the Foundation, Administrator Williams, has major concerns about the way 051 is running the program. The updates that 051 has been sending have become less scientific and more philosophical, more spiritual. Administrator Williams sends a letter to 051 reassuring him that he is doing good work. But once the mission to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon is completed, 051 will be promoted to director and reassigned to the newly constructed Site-19. For the good of the Foundation, and maybe the rest of the world, he'll be permanently moved away from Item 001. 051's response is short and to the point. I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive. Administrator Williams arrives at Site-001 a few days later. He is greeted by 051 and the Omega-5 team. Williams can't help but notice that 051 has a strange look in his eyes. It is the look of a crazed man who has been lost in his work and who has, perhaps, lost himself. Williams puts the thought away, though, and walks with 051 and his accompanying agents to the viewing area, where the powers of Item 001 will be demonstrated. Administrator Williams and the other agents watch from a protected viewing room as 051 enters the chamber of his new superweapon. It's time to see if their weapon that has had so much time, effort, sweat, tears, and especially blood poured into it will have been worth it. Everyone watches as 051 leans over and says the name of the Abaddon Citadel to the nine children. All at once, they start to glow. No one observing can see what has happened in the far off kingdom, but they know something big has happened. The administrator is thrilled, but notices something. 051 hesitated a moment while leaning over the children before standing back up. Did he whisper something else to them? And then Administrator Williams vaporizes, pulled apart at an atomic level before he has the chance to scream. What's going on? The agents standing next to where Administrator Williams previously existed begin to yell and pull out their guns. They burst through the door of the observation room and run down the hallway towards where 051 and the nine children are located. The armed agents rush into the room, but 051 is gone. The nine children are still. Over the next few weeks, 051 is reported to be seen several times by SCP agents. However, no one is able to catch him, and it appears as though other members of the SCP Foundation have also gone AWOL as well, perhaps joining him on the run. 
It is unclear what his plan is, but the reports from the reconnaissance team sent into the Sahara make it obvious what the result of his first command to the children was. There isn't a single humanoid or building left in the Kingdom of Abaddon. But even with this victory, the highest levels of the SCP Foundation have an ominous thought lurking in the back of their minds. Where did 051 go? And what is he planning to do next? Following the improper use of item 001 leading to the untimely death of a high-ranking Foundation staff member, the weapon was deemed too dangerous and containment procedures were implemented. Due to the high amount of radiation they were found to emit, the nine children were placed into lead-lined bags and buried under 50 meters of concrete beneath the church of San Marcos de la Vida Eterna. Though all of the children continued to be functionally brain-dead, they still display signs of life despite their containment, and by order of the Overseer Council, have been classified as a Thaumiel entity. The smell of fire and oil fills the air. The sound of gears grinding can be heard between the explosions and shrieks of terror. A man runs out of his house, only to have his leg grabbed by a metal arm and dragged back through his front door. SCP-001 leaves a trail of metal fragments and mechanical parts on the ground in the wake of its destruction. Iron chains swing from its form, cast iron gears whirl within it, a glowing light throbs from the center of its body. SCP-001 is consuming everything in its path. After incorporating the truck chassis into its being, SCP-001 rolls in a lumbering fashion to the next house. It rips the gutters from the side of the building. Residents who live in the area flee their neighborhood, all the while hoping that the mechanical monstrosity skips over their house so they have something to return to if they make it out alive. A section of SCP-001's undercarriage drops away from the main body. It rolls down the street, consuming more and more material. The new entity resembles a human spine and rib cage. It topples over, unable to support itself. The rib-like formations extend out to grab anything and everything within reach. The newly incorporated material forms what can only be described as a head. Light from within the eye sockets fixate on nearby civilians. The metallic creature picks up the people and places them inside its exposed steel rib cage. Then it turns and spots a woman helplessly trying to crawl away. The creature reaches out with a spiked tentacle and wraps it around the woman's body. She is placed inside of the chest cavity. Moments later, a severed hand falls out of the entity and onto the ground. The mechanical monster continues to gather bodies and materials, incorporating them into its frame. A growth begins to slowly expand on its back. It becomes so massive that the creature falls over and uses its limbs to scurry to a nearby house. There is a sickening crunching sound as the growth bursts. From within emerges three humanoid creatures resembling the civilians that the entity had consumed earlier. A female with chains extending from her scalp like dreadlocks stumbles away. The second humanoid is a man with cogs for limbs. He examines the clock-like components that have been incorporated into his body, then stares blankly into the distance. The third humanoid lies motionless on the ground. He did not make it. The two functioning humanoids look at their creator intently. For a moment, nothing moves. Then, as if they have been given orders telepathically, the half-human, half-machine humanoids turn and run away from the mayhem. A few weeks before the massacre caused by what would be designated as SCP-001, the Foundation had been in contact with the Allied Occult Initiative. There were rumors of an anomalous object in Mexico being worshipped by a group of people who identified themselves as the Church of the Broken God. Intel about the church claimed their deity was a small mechanical box filled with cogs and pistons. The box supposedly had supernatural abilities. It was said to be able to communicate with congregants of the Church of the Broken God telepathically. The devout worshipped the box, following any order it gave, and in return they were filled with an emotion that could be only described as divine. As World War II rages on in Europe, the Foundation sends agents to recover anomalies in Mexico that might help with the war effort. While there, the Foundation force is tasked with learning about the Church of the Broken God. They are also ordered to investigate a town near La Paz, where there are troubling accounts of a mechanical anomalous creature causing mayhem. The agents make their way through Mexico, gathering various objects to bring back to Foundation sites in the United States. The unit loads all of the anomalies they recovered onto a train, with a plan to check out the stories of the mechanical anomaly they've heard about as they make their way to the U.S. border. The train heads north along rusted rails, 
Just outside La Paz, they've come across a broken down train filled with what looks to be refugees. When the Foundation unit goes to investigate, they find all of the refugees repeating the same words over and over again, but they don't understand. The Foundation agents look at one another confused, until one of them translates the words into English. The words the refugees are saying over and over again are, La Machina, the machine. The commanding officer orders a squad of Foundation agents to proceed up the tracks, to see if they can figure out what has the refugees so scared. They make their way towards La Paz, disappearing over the horizon. As the sun sets, the remaining Foundation agents hear gunshots in the distance. They stay awake all night, remaining vigilant, waiting for the exploratory squad, but morning comes without anyone returning. Three days later, the Foundation force still has not seen anything since the exploratory squad left. Then, as the sun sits lazily in the morning sky, a lone figure is spotted walking down the tracks towards the trains. One of the agents on watch blows his whistle and points to the figure. A squad of agents rushes towards the shadow of a man. Their guns are raised, ready for anything. The figure drops to the ground and begins to crawl along the tracks. The agents reach the fallen man, only to find that he is one of their squad mates who has been sent up the tracks to investigate La Paz several days before. The agent's name is DeMarco. He is covered in blood. His clothes are in tatters and he has lost a boot. DeMarco lies on his back with Foundation agents standing around him. His eyes are wide and wild. He keeps babbling on about a world eater, how the rest of his squad had been mulched, and he is the only one who made it out alive. The Foundation agents carry DeMarco back to the makeshift base they created by the trains. They need to figure out a way to get the convoy moving again, but whatever is up ahead has already taken out an entire Foundation squad. It had to be something anomalous, but what could it possibly be? The unit of Foundation agents prepare to move towards La Paz. They start loading their rifles and check the amount of ammunition and explosives available in case the containment process gets out of hand. Just as they are about to leave the base, a convoy appears on the horizon. It is an allied occult initiative force preparing to attack whatever it is that is devastating La Paz. This organization's mission is to not secure, contain, or protect, but to destroy. The Foundation may be in over their heads on this one, and the joint force with the Allied Occult Initiative may be the only way to stop what is now known as SCP-001. The AOI and Foundation force gears up for battle. They set out for La Paz, and what they find causes them to quake with fear. SCP-001 has consumed so much material, it is the size of a mountain. It moves like a tidal wave of mechanical destruction, washing over the buildings and landscape under it. Whatever SCP-001 passes over is consumed and added to its massive body. SCP-001 started as a small mechanical box with cogs, but now has morphed into a gigantic metal death machine. The Church of the Broken God has finally met their maker, as the small entity they once worshipped has now consumed all of its members. Their god is an all-consuming monster. The AOI and Foundation forces do everything they can to stop SCP-001 from continuing its reign of destruction. They fire barrage after barrage of bullets and explosives into the mechanical anomaly. They bring in air support to try and damage it from the skies, but nothing works. The AOI uses an artifact in their possession to lure SCP-001 to the coast of the Pacific Ocean, where a trap has been set for the so-called god. The monstrous mechanical creature moves slowly towards the water. It consumes abandoned cars, buildings, and boats as it approaches the coastline. It even shovels large amounts of earth into its form, causing flames to spurt out from its inner workings. Smoke bellows from openings between different mechanical components, like a volcano before it is about to erupt. Suddenly, seemingly from nowhere, a massive cloud with a reddish tint appears in the sky. Air raid sirens can be heard in the distance. The enormous cloud begins to pulsate. Streaks of lightning shoot through the red mist in the sky. It now sits directly over SCP-001. From within the cloud, part of a ship can be seen. It appears to be slightly damaged. Electricity flows over its hull. The vessel in the giant red cloud is classified as SCP-2399. The underside of the vessel begins to glow aqua blue. A blinding beam of light is ejected from SCP-2399, which penetrates straight down and through SCP-001. For a moment, everything is still. There is complete silence. Then, as if SCP-001 is trying to reach up and grab the vessel above it, a mechanical bulge reaches out. 
Before SCP-001 can grab the vessel above, there is another bright flash of light. SCP-2399 blinks out of existence. The sound of grinding gears can be heard coming from within SCP-001. It begins to shed its outer layers of metal. Then, the entire structure that was SCP-001 collapses into the water and onto the beach. Giant cogs fall from the sky. Parts of vehicles embed themselves in the sand. As the Foundation and AOI agents approach the piles of scrap metal and mechanical components, they see that some of them are still moving. It is as if an invisible power source is still pulsating through some of the machinery. The agents of the Foundation celebrate the destruction of the giant mechanical beast, but little do they know this was only a piece of the entity worshipped as the Broken God. The Foundation agents collect as many of the still-moving parts as they can. They find spinning gears, twitching pulleys, and firing pistons. As the parts are separated from one another and carried away from the main wreckage of SCP-001, they slowly stop moving and become inactive. Some of the artifacts recovered were identified as being connected to the Church of the Broken God. These artifacts are found closer to the middle of what was once a mountain-sized SCP-001. Hundreds of anomalous artifacts are collected and transported to SCP Foundation sites. Collecting the broken parts of SCP-001 is relatively safe. However, some agents get too close to the larger moving parts, getting caught in them and losing a body part or two. But most agents proceed with caution and survive the collection ordeal with their arms and legs still attached to their bodies. Dive teams are sent into the water to recover parts that have sunk to the bottom of the sea. One of the divers is a local from the area. He is hired to bring up the heart of the machine, since he is an experienced diver used to freediving to great depths to collect oysters from the bottom of the bay. The diver enters the water and swims down into the murky depths. He secures straps around the heart of SCP-001 and pulls hard on the rope, as an indication to the surface that it is ready to be hauled up. The salvage team on the surface begins to pull. There is a second slight tug on the rope, then it goes slack. The team continues to pull. When they get the heart to the surface, they are horrified at what else comes up with it. Tangled in the ropes is the lifeless body of the diver. His head is smashed between two moving pieces of the heart. It looks as if he shoved his head between the slabs of metal himself. The salvage team untangles the body, rolls it off the deck, and back into the ocean. The mechanical box which was the heart of SCP-001 is offloaded on the shore, but as the Foundation prepares to move it to a containment facility, the weather starts to deteriorate. Hurricane force wind sweeps across the water and batter the coast. The heart is kept in a secured storage warehouse until it can be moved. The people living in the village nearby complain of hearing voices and rashes so itchy that they practically tear their skin off. Once the storm passes, the Foundation agents load the heart onto a ship. It is to be transported to a Foundation site just across the border. The ocean seems calm and serene. The Foundation ship undocks and begins its journey up the coast. Not too long after beginning its journey, the ship slowly drifts off course. It is as if the crew has stopped manning their posts, and the ship is being controlled by a mind of its own. The Foundation ship crashes and sinks somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, never to be found. And most importantly, the heart of SCP-001 doesn't make it to the Foundation site. Years later, a man is walking along the beach. He hears something. It sounds like someone pounding on a large drum to the rhythm of a heartbeat. The man walks towards the sound. Something is drawing him forward, closer and closer to the heartbeat. He walks and walks until the beating stops. He bends down and moves the sand aside. He spots the corner of a mechanical box sticking out of the white sand. The man digs deeper and pulls out the small box. Inside, he can see gears whirling and pistons firing. He holds the box close to his own heart. It seems to speak to him. The man brings the box back to town. He starts to worship the box and soon more and more people in the area join the new religion. They cast aside their own beliefs and focus on the powerful entity contained within the box. God is not dead, at least not yet. But the prophecies of the Church of the Broken God say that when the heart is found, the God will reassemble itself once again. Then the Unbroken God will destroy all other false deities, until only he remains. It's a quiet evening at Area 11 where the Pietrakau Fountain Spatial Stabilization Array is housed. A skeleton crew is working overnight to ensure the array is ready for its big test the following day. 
The Foundation has been working on a particle accelerator that will contain anomalies with the ability to manipulate the nature of space-time. The preliminary tests seem promising, but a few last-minute tweaks to the array are necessary. Unfortunately, it is on this night in 1982 that marks the beginning of the end for the SCP Foundation. Dr. Calvin Desmond is monitoring the array, and he notices as it spools up that there are some minor power fluctuation in one of the stabilization arms. This problem is not uncommon, due to the vast amounts of energy being pumped through the array and the harmonic resonance the machine gives off, which slowly causes the coupling rings to loosen. Calvin Desmond decides that remounting the stabilization rings will be an easy fix, and it's a necessary one. He knows that if the rings fail during the actual test, the array could end up shut down for months. There is still plenty of time, so Calvin Desmond grabs his toolbox and heads down to the array. The machine is still spooling, keeping the energy flowing at a constant low rate. There is no danger at the moment, as the inside of the array is shielded from the radiation and energy pulsing through the outer ring. But then, something unexpected happens. The system's primary generator begins to fluctuate uncontrollably. A catastrophic failure is imminent. Sirens begin to sound, the facility is evacuated, and the chamber is sealed. Deep in the bowels of the array, Calvin Desmond cannot hear the evacuation announcement. The humming of the array echoes through the chamber, dampening all sound from the outside world. The array begins to come online while Desmond continues to work on the coupling. He has no idea what is about to happen. Meanwhile, a team of Foundation scientists scramble to get the power fluctuations in the main generator under control. As they frantically work, catastrophe strikes. They initiate the power down cycle, but as the generator struggles to keep the power flow balanced, an energy surge builds up. A massive amount of energy is released all at once, causing the main reactor to explode. The entire structure rocks back and forth, and Desmond is thrown into the side of the array. He too now knows that something is very wrong, and runs for the exit. When he reaches the door, he finds that it has been sealed. In a panic, Desmond continues running through the tube to the next access point. This door has been locked as well. He's never been so scared in his entire life and he shakes uncontrollably from the adrenaline being dumped into his muscles. The surge of energy rushes through the array towards Desmond. A singularity begins to form in the containment chamber. The array is working just as it should, except that there was never supposed to be a person inside as the singularity was brought into existence. Moments after the singularity forms, the massive pull of its gravity causes the stabilizer arm that Desmond had been working on to fail. The side of the array is ripped off and Calvin Desmet stares into the naked eye of the Singularity. Everything is silent and still for a moment. Then the Singularity collapses in on itself, taking the test chamber and much of the research wing with it, along with Dr. Calvin Desmet. Sparking wires hang from the exposed walls and ceiling where the Singularity rips the main structure away. Water flows into the deep hole carved out of the earth where the array once stood. The scientists from Area 11 look into the crater left by the collapsed singularity. The Foundation Administration sends agents to collect the staff at the site and document the failings of the project. They conclude that the accident was caused by human error. They order the array to be rebuilt, this time using entirely automated systems to eliminate the chances of another mishap occurring. Several years after the catastrophic events at Area 11, a new array is constructed. An intelligence system called NetZack is put in charge of overseeing its functions. It is a supercomputer that is programmed to follow commands, but can autonomously make decisions in order to prevent any failures in the system. Experiments begin again in May of 2006. The new array soon manifests its first singularity in the containment chamber at Area 11, and what happens next will forever change the Foundation and the multiverse. The singularity is kept stable in the array, it seems as if the Foundation has succeeded in trapping and containing spatial anomalies. But as they run more diagnostics on the anomaly, something unexpected happens. The singularity begins to grow in size. The point of infinite gravity threatens to breach containment as it reaches the boundaries of the array. Just before contact, the singularity's growth slows and then stops. Netzak has made the split-second calculations and adjustments necessary to contain the singularity. The artificial intelligence has saved the facility and the lives of everyone in it. Now, sitting in the array, is a thick, rotating cloud of radioactive gas and dust, obscuring the singularity 
within. As Foundation scientists work rapidly to fix the array, odd events begin to occur. The workers hear noises that sound like painful wailing. Over time, the noises evolve into words, and then full sentences. They seem to be originating from the singularity. Using equipment able to penetrate the thick cloud of radioactive gas, the Foundation scientists get a glimpse at the singularity. To their surprise, the singularity has taken on the shape of a human. The scientists work frantically to figure out how the singularity could have formed itself into a humanoid shape. Dr. J. Barton Ramsey is the first to try and make contact with the humanoid within the singularity. He finds that the entity cannot communicate in the traditional sense. The massive gravitational pull of the singularity does not allow sound to escape its void. Instead, the entity manipulates gravity to vibrate the suspension rings of the array itself and create sound waves. The being in the singularity whispers in a metallic voice created by the vibrating of the array's rings and says, Johannes Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey steps back from the observation window. How do you know my name? He asks the entity. The humanoid within the swirling gas cloud identifies itself as having the memories of Calvin Desmond. It is not Desmond per se. The being in the singularity is so much more than one person, but it was somehow created by the accident that had sucked Calvin Desmond into the singularity years before. The entity seems to switch between the mind of Desmond and the vast infinity of the cosmos. The Desmond entity asks for an overseer from the Foundation to be brought in. It has a proposal for the O5 Council. When Dr. Ramsey asks why the entity needs to talk to the overseers, it replies that it wants to offer them a way out. The following day, O51 enters the facility and heads to the observation deck. He looks through the reinforced glass at the swirling cloud of radioactive dust, then glances at the monitor to see the humanoid shape of the singularity within. He presses the microphone button on the console and addresses the entity. To whom am I speaking? He asks. For simplicity's sake, the entity tells O5-1 to refer to him as Calvin Desmond. O5-1 makes notes of the events unfolding before him, and then asks about the way out that Calvin had mentioned. The air is still for a moment. Then, Desmond begins to speak through the vibration of the structure once again. He informs O5-1 that what the SCP Foundation is doing, by securing and containing anomalous entities around the world, is like putting a small band-aid on a much bigger wound. Desmond wants to propose a final solution to all of the Foundation's problems. O5-1 listens intently as the entity unravels the mysteries of where the SCPs have come from. He explains that the anomalies that the Foundation has worked so hard to secure, contain, and protect the human race from are actually bleeding into their reality from a vast multiverse. The only way to stop the manifestation of anomalies into this universe is to destroy all other realities. The entity that is Calvin Desmond tells O5-1 that he is able to bring about this destruction if they release him from the confines of the array. O5-1 is transfixed by the swirling gas that is promising him and everyone else on Earth salvation. He shakes his head in disbelief. Could this be true? O5-1 turns away from the swirling gas and begins to walk away from the viewing glass. I'll need to think about what you're saying. The structure begins to shake slightly. The voice of Calvin Desmond reverberates off of the array a little louder than before. Choose quickly, Overseer. Although it won't happen for decades, eventually a catastrophic SCP event will wipe out life on this planet. Perhaps not in your lifetime, but it will most certainly happen within the lifetime of your children. We will talk again soon. The vibrations slow and then stop completely. There is an eerie stillness in the observation room as O5-1 walks out. The next day, all staff members located at Area 11 are relocated to other Foundation sites and given amnestics. The O5 Council meets in a large circular room with wood paneling and no windows. O5-1 begins the meeting by telling the others what Calvin Desmond had described about the end of the world. He pauses for what seems like an eternity and tells them of Desmond's offer that he could prevent the end of the world but at the cost of destroying an infinite number of other realities. This would mean that all the humans and creatures of those realities would be destroyed as well. Was murdering countless other beings worth it to protect their own reality? O5-1 begins to shake. He hasn't slept or eaten anything since his talk with Desmond. 
He's being torn apart from the inside. O5-3 stands up and addresses the council. He informs everyone in the room that independent teams have concluded research into what the Calvin Desmond entity has claimed, and they found it to be true. The world really would come to an end. Furthermore, the research teams determined that the capabilities of Desmond would in fact allow him to dismantle the other realities. O5-3 insists that the Council must vote to allow Desmond to destroy the other realities to ensure that this reality could be saved. They must strike now before the world is overrun. O5-1 continues to shake while O5-3 breathes heavily, sweat pouring down his temples. The rest of the Council shifts their gazes from side to side. It is time for a vote. There are eight eyes to allow Desmond to destroy all of the realities and four nays against the plan. O5-3 stands up and walks around the room, stopping behind each nay voter and putting a bullet in their head. He stops at the last, O5-9, who pulls out a gun, places it under her own chin, and pulls the trigger. O5-13 abstains from the vote and the measure passes. The remaining overseers will use the Calvin Desmond entity to save the reality at the expense of all others, and they soon head to Area 11 to execute their plan. O5-1, 4, and 12 enter the observation room that looks upon the swirling radioactive gas around Calvin Desmond. O5-1 orders Netzak to begin powering down the array which will allow the entity to prove he can do what he has promised. They have pinpointed the reality that SCP-884 came from, and the shaving mirror itself sits on a table in another room in the facility. O5-3 stands in the room, watching the mirror to see if anything happens. O5-1 asks Calvin Desmond to eliminate the reality that the mirror had come from. The room shakes as the entity uses it to acknowledge the request. Moments later, the phone rings in the observation room. It is O5-3. He informs the others that the mirror has disappeared. Its reality has been destroyed, and therefore, it no longer exists. There is a sigh of relief in the room as the overseers realize that this just might work. O5-1 asks Calvin Desmond to continue and destroy all the realities that are bleeding into their own. This time, the entire facility begins to quake. Suddenly, O5-1 jerks backwards. His eyes wide in confusion and horror. His body seems to be compressing under an unknown force. O5-1 begins to distort. His legs and arms fold into the core of his body. His head snaps down, and all that was O5-1 is sucked down into a single point in space before it completely disappears. Calvin Desmond then turns his attention to the other two overseers in the room, who both seem to collapse into black holes of their own in the center of their bodies. Netzak's warning klaxon begins to sound, signaling that the emergency failsafe has been activated. Before Calvin Desmond is brought under control, the structural support in the entire facility vibrates with his words. They are in a voice that sounds strangely similar to O51's. Your children are free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. This world must be washed clean. The Foundation does not escape atonement. It is the only way out. It had been a deception. The Calvin Desmond entity had no intention of stopping anomalies from infiltrating this world. It wanted to remove all traces of the anomalies from all universes, including this one and that meant destroying the Overseers and the Foundation itself. Their destruction would serve as an atonement for the pain and suffering they had caused in their quest to secure and contain the Anomalous. Calvin had to lie to the Overseers about the real plan, since he knew they'd never sacrifice themselves and the Foundation, even if it meant an end to the Anomalies plaguing our world. Now though, with the Overseers out of the way, the Calvin Desmond entity is free to move forward with its plan and purge all realities of any trace of the Anomalous. But just then, Netzak's failsafes kick in and the Petrakal Fountain Spatial Stabilization Array subdues the entity's abilities. Desmond is once again contained. O5-3 bursts through the door and into the observation room. He stands before the shattered glass of the window that looks into the array. O53 asks Netzak how long the containment array can hold Calvin Desmet. The computer's voice fades in and out 
but says, Given current conditions, 119 days, 6 hours, and 47 minutes. 05-3 size. He tells Netzak to make a node in the SCP database that the Calvin Desmet entity will now be known as SCP-001. Then, to make dozens of other randomly generated entries and label them as SCP-001 as well. He knows that they will need to keep the true nature of what this entity can do a secret. 05-3 walks out of the room. Under his breath, he speaks to himself. They'll say that I'll know the one true god when I see it, and to give that god everything it wants, because that's the only thing that matters. Tonight, it appears god wants to talk to me. Calvin Lucian stands at the end of a dusty table in an abandoned warehouse. In the shadows across from him sits several hidden figures. The warehouse is falling apart, but is suitable for the meeting Calvin has requested with the heads of the Chaos Insurgency. He has completed numerous missions for the organization, and each one has been successful. Now he is proposing one final mission. Calvin Lucian takes a tattered journal out of his bag and slides it across the table to the figures sitting in the shadows. It's a journal, with details on the habits of each of the 13 Foundation Overseers, he says. There is silence from the other end of the table. A hand reaches out and grabs the journal. The pages begin to turn. The new models indicate an anomalous catastrophe is imminent. Not even the Foundation can stop it. The only way to save the world is to kill the Overseers. There are whispers from across the table as Calvin continues. The proliferation of anomalies in the world are the fault of the Overseers. They have been meddling with reality. If business continues as usual, we might not make it out of the 2020s. We need to act now. The whispering from the shadows resumes this time with what seems to be a little more urgency. One of the voices asks the question on everyone's mind. How do you plan to kill the Overseers? They have a deal with death. They are immortal. Calvin smiles and takes out a small vial from his jacket pocket. With this, he says, there is a silence from the shadows. The journal slides back across the table and comes to a stop right in front of Calvin. A deep voice from the shadows says, Do it. Calvin Lucian gathers his team. The codename given to the group is Kill Squad. He informs them that they've been cleared to take out the Overseers. It will be the most dangerous mission they've ever been on, and even if successful, they probably won't make it out alive. But the team is loyal. They set out to confront the 13th Overseer. This has to be their first stop because without eliminating 05-13, nothing else will matter. It is this Overseer who has a deal with death. A deal that protects all of the Foundation Overseers from dying. If that deal can be broken, then Calvin Lucian and his team will have a shot at eradicating the other Overseers. If the deal with death cannot be broken, all is lost. The team boards a ship at the tip of South America and sails towards the frozen waters of Antarctica. The kill squad is made up of Calvin and three others. They sit in the galley preparing for the mission ahead. Anthony Wright is a battle-hardened soldier who sits at one end of the table. His face is covered with scars. No one can remember when he first joined the insurgency, because it was so long ago. Next to him is Olivia Torres. She is an anarchist who was recruited into the insurgency after she was liberated from a Foundation site during a raid. Adam Ivanov sits staring into his computer screen. He is testing different gadgets that might be of use on the mission. He pushes his glasses up the bridge of his nose and strikes the enter key. A long line of code begins to scroll across the screen. A siren begins to sound, informing the crew to make their way to the main deck. When they surface from the bowels of the ship, they see something in the distance. It is a giant black tower rising from the depths of the ocean like an evil iceberg. Waves crash over the side of the railings, drenching the deck and crew with frigid water. Calvin looks at the jagged rocks along the shore of the tower. There is no way to safely dock. There is only one way onto the island. They know what needs to be done. Anthony waits for the next wave, then opens the throttle to full. The ship is carried towards the island on the crest of the wave. The hull is impaled on the rocks surrounding the tower, sending everything flying towards the front of the boat. See? That wasn't so bad. Calvin says to his team as he bandages a gash on his hand. Knowing what lays ahead, Calvin orders his team to wait on the ship while he makes his own deal with death. He enters the dark structure and is greeted by a corpse. The corpse speaks to him, ejecting dust from its lungs with every word. Its breath smells like decaying flesh. Death has inhabited the body of Dr. Felix Carter, the 13th Overseer. 
Calvin is prepared, though thanks to the notes in the journal he possesses. Without hesitating, he takes out a small bottle of liquid from his pocket and lunges at the corpse. He grabs it by the neck, tilts the head back, and pours liquid down what is left of the throat of Felix Carter. The corpse reanimates into the living Dr. Carter. Death has been removed from his body by liquid from the fountain of youth that Calvin had acquired on a previous raid on a Foundation site. Seeing that Dr. Carter is now alive, Calvin takes out his pistol and shoots the doctor twice, killing him. Calvin picks up the body and throws it into a bottomless pit at the base of the tower. Dr. Felix Carter's body disappears from sight. The Overseer's deal with death is now broken. They are vulnerable and can be killed at last. Calvin smiles and begins to turn away from the pit when he comes face to face with death. She stands with her head cocked to the side looking at Calvin. So it is you who has broken the Overseer's deal with me, Calvin Lucian. Calvin takes a step back. Why didn't she stop him from killing Felix Carter? Something festers at the heart of the Council, Death says. Something that will not die. I thought that perhaps if I had a seat at their table, I could find it, make it die. But I couldn't. There are things in this world beyond even my reach, Calvin Lucian. With that parting thought, Death vanishes. The Kill Squad contacts the Insurgency for an evac and then makes their way to Japan, where O5-12, also known as the Accountant, has been working out of Tokyo. He is so proficient in mathematics and probability that he can actually predict the future. Everything about the Accountant's life, down to the number of breaths and steps he takes each day, is predetermined, based on his own statistical models. This poses a problem for Calvin and his team. If the Accountant can see them coming, then how can they possibly kill him? That night, the Accountant steps out of his car, he looks to the left and spots Adam. He has already predicted this man has hostile intentions. The accountant walks directly towards Adam and before he can react, throws the kill squad member to the ground. Then he turns slightly and adjusts his watch, sending a glare directly into the window where Anthony has the accountant in his sights of his sniper rifle. Anthony fires, but misses due to being blinded by the glare. The accountant is surprised that he just barely had time to avoid being shot. Normally, he would be several steps ahead of anyone trying to kill him. He turns his head and watches as Olivia helps Adam up and they run down a nearby alley. The accountant pursues them and corners the kill squad members in the alley. He pulls a gun to shoot Adam, but Olivia tackles Adam behind a dumpster as the bullet hits the wall directly behind where Adam was standing. The accountant can't believe that he missed and that he was almost tricked into being captured by the insurgency team. He senses uncertainty in his assailant's actions and runs away unable to predict exactly what they are planning to do. The accountant climbs the stairs to a subway station and boards the last car of the train. It is empty except for one man, Calvin Lucian. The accountant is dumbfounded. How are you here? He screams. I should have seen this coming. Calvin stands up. He uses his thumb to flip a coin into the air. On the way down, he grabs it and smacks it on the back of his opposing hand. Calvin smiles. The team has been making their decisions based on the flip of a coin, which introduced randomness into their actions that even this super advanced mathematician could not account for. Tell me where 05-11 is, demands Calvin. The accountant pauses, then shakes his head no. If he's going to die either way, then why give any information to the kill squad? Calvin flips the coin up in the air, catches it, and looks at it. The coin is face up. Calvin lifts his pistol and shoots the accountant in the head. A few nights later, Olivia stands on a balcony outside of an art exhibit overlooking the city of Seattle. Anthony walks up behind her and tells her that the Foundation is defeated, but Olivia doesn't understand how. We broke the Overseer's deal with death and killed the accountant. There's nothing more to do. We can go back to our normal lives, he tells her. Olivia is skeptical, though. What about the 11th Overseer and his ability to... Olivia's eyes suddenly go wide. She pulls out a knife and stabs it into Anthony's heart. The world around her begins to distort and fall apart. It was a false reality created by O5-11, better known as The Liar. Olivia wakes up next to Adam in a hotel room. She sits up in a bed and rubs her eyes. What a weird dream, she thinks. Then she realizes it wasn't a dream. She shakes Adam awake. Neither of them have any idea how they ended up here, but they know it must be the doing of The Liar. They had planned for this, though. With Calvin having created a contingency plan, they pull out a laptop and log in to view the classified information Calvin left for them. Olivia begins to type but stops halfway through her password and looks up from the screen. Olivia pulls out the gun that rests under her pillow and shoots at him. The false reality created by the liar falls apart around her. Olivia comes out of the previous lie and is sitting across the table from Calvin. 
She immediately draws her pistol and points it at Calvin's head. Is it really him? Or just another one of the liar's games? Calvin tries to talk Olivia down and she looks around the room for inconsistencies that might tip her off that this is another lie, but doesn't find any. Olivia begins to relax. She tells Calvin that the liar is trying to get something from her. Maybe the journal can tell them what he is looking for, as long as she still has it. Olivia nods her head and holds out her wrist where a subdermal chip with a copy of the journal on it has been placed. Calvin looks at her wrist. The world around them begins to dissipate as Calvin morphs into the liar. Olivia wakes up in a hospital where she is hooked up to an IV. Sitting across from her is a former insurgency agent named Sam Beale. He explains to her that he is the liar. He was forced into becoming a monster by the Foundation. They had manipulated him, but now he is tired of running and can't do it anymore. She is free to go. Olivia hesitantly unhooks herself from the IV. She walks out of the hospital room and proceeds down a fluorescent lit hallway. As she walks away, she hears a gunshot from the hospital room. As Olivia is in the hospital, Calvin and Adam walk through a dense forest. They are searching for 05-10. The journal indicates that the 10th Overseer's identity within the Foundation is the Archivist. In the middle of the clearing are two saplings standing side by side. The void between the saplings shimmers. Calvin walks through the portal and the space begins to warp and twist around him. His vision finally comes back into focus and Calvin finds himself in another world. Adam enters the world behind Calvin, practically knocking him over as he enters through the portal. This is the Wanderer's Library, but it doesn't look anything like they expected. Instead of rows of books, the library is filled with computer mainframes, humming with the collected knowledge of how to contain anomalies, a critical backup. As the two look intently at the strange machines, a figure in a silver robe suddenly steps out of the darkness. It's tall and thin, and though its hood is pulled down so they can't see its face, they can see that its hands are covered in scales that have a slight emerald tint. It is one of the librarians. Calvin tells the librarian that they are seeking the archivist, but the librarian tells them that the archivist is no longer in the library. She has broken her pact with the serpent and eaten fruit from the forbidden trees. If they want to see her, though, the librarian can take them to her. Calvin and Adam follow the librarian down a long staircase, passing by countless doors filled with books, scrolls, works of art, an entire universe of knowledge. Eventually, they reach the bottom of the stairs where there stands a giant set of brass doors. Beyond the door, the librarian explains, is the source of all knowledge. Before Calvin and Adam pass through the doors, though, Calvin turns to the librarian. Before we go in, I'd like to make a withdrawal, he says. The librarian nods and pulls out a silver tube out of its robe. It hands the tube to Adam, and he looks it over in his hands. He looks up to ask what this is, but the librarian has vanished. The door then opens, and the two step through. Calvin and Adam feel as if they walk through the same kind of portal that brought them to the library and find that they have walked into a lush green valley with two trees. Sitting underneath one of them is a woman in a white dress. She is reading a book and eating a piece of fruit. Are you the archivist? Calvin asks. The woman nods yes, and that's all the confirmation Calvin needs. He raises his pistol and fires, but the bullet passes right through the archivist as if she wasn't there. Do you read? The archivist asks Calvin, seemingly not phased by his attempts to shoot her. I haven't had much time recently, Calvin replied. The archivist explains that she's read every book in the library. The collected knowledge of the universe is in the books, even one on how to allow bullets to pass through your body. She came here to find the secret to immortality. It's her job to document everything that happens in the world, and she can't do that if she's dead. She explains that she figured out that the fruit that the serpent forbade everyone to eat was an actual fruit, but the knowledge contained in the library. By having read every book, she has consumed the fruit. She no longer needs the serpent, because she was the serpent. The archivist falls to the ground and begins to writhe around, contorting her body as it starts to change. She begins to elongate as her limbs seemingly disappear. The next thing Calvin and Adam know, they are face to face with a giant snake. Calvin dodges as the serpent lunges at him and Adam stands in the doorway, firing at the snake with his pistol. But just like with the archivist's human form, the bullets have no effect. 
The serpent coils around Calvin and begins to choke the life from him as Adam can only watch, helpless. Calvin cries out with his last breath. The tube, Adam! Open the tube! Adam takes the tube that was given to him by the librarian and opens the cap. A long, heavy spear slides out that looks much too large to have ever fit inside. He drops the tube to the ground and watches in amazement as it starts to transform, turning into what looks like a large harpoon gun. Adam knows what to do and places the giant spear into the gun and points it at the serpent. You can't kill me, the giant snake says. I've eaten from the tree of life. Adam pulls the trigger and the huge spear flies through the air, striking the serpent in the head. Adam runs to Calvin and helps him to his feet. They turn to look at the snake, but instead of the menacing creature, it's the archivist once again, pinned against the tree she once sat under, the spear sticking out of her skull. As the two stand, looking at the archivist, a tall, hooded, humanoid figure steps out from behind the tree. It looks similar to the librarian, except its robe is a greenish color and it wears long black gloves. The creature pulls the spear out of the archivist, whose body slumps to the ground and hands the spear to Calvin. Who are you? Calvin asks, but his question is ignored. After a moment, the figure finally speaks. That spear you now hold is called the Spear of the Non-Believer. It is an ancient weapon used to kill gods. It is odd that someone in this realm gave you the spear. Even with it, I am not sure you will be able to complete your quest, Calvin Lucian. But we shall see. There is a sudden flash of light, and Calvin and Adam find themselves transported back to the forest they had entered the Wanderer's Library from. A week later, Calvin and Anthony track down O5-9, who in the council is known as the Outsider. She isn't hard to find, and it seems as if she actually wanted to be found. They find her sitting outside of her burnt-down family home. The journal had listed this as her address, but Calvin doubted that she would be here, and most he hoped to find a clue to her whereabouts. But here she was, sitting in the ashes of her home. Without turning around, the Outsider began speaking. The council just used me, you know, she says. They took away my academic career, my friends, and my life. They made me conduct research for them that compromised everything I stood for, and now here I am with nothing. The Outsider lets out a sigh. She asks Calvin if he's afraid of death. Calvin shakes his head and responds, No. The Outsider slumps forward and Calvin walks around to face her. She is covered in blood. Her eyes move to look up at Calvin. You're lying, she says, as she dies from self-inflicted wounds. Calvin and Anthony cross 05-9 off the list and head back to the car. As they walk, Anthony says what's been on everyone's mind the last few days. The easy part is done. We'll only get harder from here. We know 05-8 is in his castle. I'm sure we'll get in, but I'm not sure if we'll make it out alive. I know, replies Calvin. But if we're going to save the world, we must eliminate the rest of the overseers, even if it means sacrificing our own lives. They get in the car and drive off into the blood-red sunset to pick up the rest of the Kill Squad team before their next mission. Calvin Lucian leads the Kill Squad team through the mud and freezing rain. In front of them looms the fortress of Baron Lehman Hoadley, the eighth overseer. The team has already been through a lot, from breaking the overseer council's deal with death by eliminating 05-13, to using the spear of the non-believer to kill the godlike archivist, 05-10. The hunting of overseers has taken a toll on the Kill Squad. 05-12 almost killed Adam, and Olivia was stuck in what seemed like an endless mind game with 05-11. The first five overseers were eliminated, but the words that the ninth overseer spoke to Calvin Lucian before she died still run through his mind. Are you afraid of death? Now the Kill Squad is about to infiltrate one of the most heavily guarded facilities in the world to eliminate the eighth overseer. Upon reaching the castle, the team is surprised to find the structure is in ruin. No one is supposed to know the location of 05-8 though. The fortress was supposed to be practically impregnable. They storm the castle of 05-8 all the same. The journal Calvin possesses that contains information about the members of the SCP Foundation's powerful 05 Council identifies him as a former industrialist named Baron Lehman Hoadley. With his vast wealth, Hoadley funded the Foundation at the start and was considered the unofficial leader of the Council in its early days with immense control over the actions of the organization. 
the Kill Squad makes their way through the dimly lit hallways of the castle. As they turn the corner, they are surprised to find the charred remains of Baron Lehman Hoadley's bodyguards. It seems that someone or something has gotten to Hoadley before they could. The team makes their way to the main chamber and breaches the door. Laying by a still-lit fireplace is 05-8. The Kill Squad scans the room to make sure the killer isn't still in there with them. Adam walks over to the body and examines it. He quickly realizes that Hoadley hasn't been murdered at all. He sees that Baron Hoadley's body has been drastically modified using anomalous technology. The Overseer used his immortality to modify almost every part of his body to make himself stronger. Unfortunately for Baron Hoadley, when the Overseer's deal with death was broken by Calvin, the modifications to his body slowly tore him apart. His regular body could no longer support all of the modifications, and what once made him practically invincible became the very thing that destroyed him. The team leaves the castle and crosses 05-8 off their list. On their way out, Adam pulls Calvin aside. He has the feeling that Anthony hasn't been completely honest with the rest of the team. He had the feeling that Anthony was hiding something from them. Calvin had similar thoughts recently. He pushes Anthony for more information about his past, and Anthony reveals that he's over 100 years old. The vial of water from the Fountain of Youth that Calvin has was not the only one. Early in his career with the Insurgency, he had confiscated other vials from a Foundation site. His squad drank the water and it extended their lives. He asks Calvin on what he plans on doing with his water from the Fountain. I'm going to destroy it, Calvin tells him. Anthony agrees with this plan. Once you drink from the Fountain of Youth, you may extend your life, but a part of you dies at the same time. Vibrancy of the senses disappears, leading to a seemingly shallow life. If Anthony could go back and do it again, he never would have drank the water. Calvin receives intel from the insurgency that the seventh overseer is in a small town in Cambodia. The kill squad makes their way to the village and surveys the area, hoping to get a glimpse at the overseer who is codenamed Green. As the team conducts reconnaissance, Anthony tells them that he thinks the mission is a setup. It is too remote, and there are so many unknown variables. But Calvin is convinced that this might be their only chance to kill Green. Since Green arrived in the area, there has been non-stop chaos. She has destabilized the local governments, and now the area is in an all-out war. The team weaves through narrow passageways between houses and buildings, trying to make their way to the central compound where Green is located. Suddenly, a mob starts to form. They are getting closer and closer to the team. In a quick decision to avoid being seen, Calvin orders everyone into a nearby building. Before Anthony can follow, the mob rounds the corner. They spot Anthony, and he's forced to flee. Calvin, Olivia, and Adam watch as the mob chases after Anthony, but they have to keep moving. Calvin knows that Anthony can take care of himself, and they are too close to their goal to stop now. Calvin slowly opens the front door of the house they are hiding in and peers out. The coast looks clear, so he signals Olivia and Adam to follow him. Before they can step out into the street, a gas canister enters through a cracked doorway. The room fills with sleeping gas and the team passes out. When they are awake, they are tied up in a large room with marble vaulted ceilings. 05-7 is standing in front of Calvin. She smiles wickedly while holding a knife. She compliments Calvin on what he and his team have been able to do so far. No one believed they could pull off even a fraction of what they have. But now she has an offer for Calvin. She points towards Adam and Olivia and tells Calvin he must choose one of them to die. If he doesn't, she'll kill the leader of the rioters and plunge another part of the country into chaos. Screw you, is Calvin's response. Very well, utters Green. Have it your way. She assassinates the leader being held in her compound, then turns back to Calvin. She now threatens to torture his team until Calvin makes a choice of who to kill. Green slashes Adam's cheek with her knife as Calvin screams for Green to leave his team alone and torture him instead. Green just smiles. I'm going to enjoy killing your friends while you watch, as you have killed so many of my overseers on the council. She reaches up in the air with the knife above Adam's head. Before she can plunge the knife through his skull, a bullet passes through her hand, causing her to drop the knife. Anthony kneels on a rooftop across the courtyard, smoking sniper rifles still pointed at Green who runs. 
Calvin uses the dropped knife to cut his ropes and chases after Green. He follows her to the roof where he watches as she boards a helicopter. The aircraft lifts off as Anthony fires at it from his original position, but does no serious damage. In the plaza below, the mob that has separated the team earlier becomes restless. There is complete chaos and someone fires a rocket at the fleeing helicopter. The rocket hits the tail of the aircraft, sending it crashing into the plaza full of rioters below as the crowd flees from the scene. Calvin makes his way towards the wreckage and reaches it at the same time Anthony does. Calvin looks at him, smiles, and thanks him for saving his life. Anthony smiles back, but before he can say anything, a gunshot rings out and a bullet rips through his neck. Calvin turns to see where it came from and is horrified to see the burning body of 05-7. Her skin has been charred black, but in her burnt hand she holds a gun. What's left of her lips curl back in a sinister grin as she fires again and hits Anthony in the chest. He falls to the ground. Calvin runs to him and pulls out his gun to shoot 05-7, but she is already dead. Calvin holds his dying teammate as blood pours out of his neck and chest, but Calvin can stop this. He pulls out the vial of water from the fountain. No, winces Anthony. I have lived long enough. Thank you, my friend. I will see you in whatever lies beyond this life. Anthony's chest rises, then falls. It does not rise again. Olivia and Adam round the corner to see Calvin holding the lifeless body of their teammate, tears flowing from his eyes. The team holds a small ceremony and burial for Anthony, but are only halfway through their mission and can't stop now. They fly back to the United States, where an undercover insurgency agent named Kowalski informs them that 05-6 is already aware they are after him. This overseer is codenamed the American because he has the power of the entire US military at his fingertips. The Kill Squad scouts the base where the American is located. Kowalski warns them of a crate that was recently brought to the base from Site-19. The Americans showed great interest in whatever was in the container. The group sets up a camp on a hill overlooking the base. As the sun slowly rises the next day, the Kill Squad is spotted by a drone and forced to hop in their jeep and try to run. They make their way down the hill, finding themselves in the valley below with no clear exit. In front of them lands a helicopter as Humvees roar into the canyon behind them. The team is surrounded. A jeep pulls up and 05-6 steps out. He introduces himself as Rufus King, member of the Overseer Council, but an American citizen first and foremost. All he really wants is to protect the country he loves. Thanks to you, I've lost my immortality and can no longer effectively protect the United States anymore, the American says to Calvin. But I am willing to make a deal. Your freedom for the spear of the non-believer. Rumor has it that you have the spear in your possession and you used it to kill the archivist. You give me the spear, I will let you go. No, replies Calvin. I will never give an overseer the means to cause more destruction. The spear stays with us. Very well, the American says with a frown. Then I suppose my only other option is to take it from you, but not without giving you a fair chance. Run, Calvin Lucian. Run as fast as you can. I will be coming for you. The American turns and walks towards the container from Site-19, which is being lowered from a helicopter hovering above them. Calvin sprints back to the jeep with the other members of his team. As they drive away, they hear a horrible, guttural screech from whatever was inside the container. After a few moments, the army begins to pursue them. Out in front of the military force is 05-6 riding SCP-682. He is using a black whip to urge the creature forward, and they're gaining on the kill squad. Fast. A row of vehicles pulls up beside the American and SCP-682. Then something strange happens. A man appears in front of the oncoming forces led by the American. The man's skin bulges and seems to be moving from within. The skin of the man slouses from his body. The infection that is SCP-610 erupts out of him and onto the soldiers in the nearby jeep. SCP-610 begins to infect and consume everyone around it. Suddenly, there are thousands of instances of SCP-610 coming from the mountainside, flooding into the valley. They close in and around the army and 05-6. The American begins fighting off the flesh-eating creatures from the back of SCP-682, but he becomes overwhelmed. He can no longer focus on pursuing Calvin and his team. 
From the back of the Jeep, Olivia pulls out her rifle. She aims and fires. The bullet hits the American in the chest. He is flung off the back of SCP-682 and engulfed in a sea of SCP-610 creatures. The kill squad continues to drive, trying to put as much distance between themselves and the SCP-610 infestation as possible. But then Calvin suddenly slams on the brake. Standing in front of them is a man in a black suit and bow tie. He introduces himself as Blackbird, the fifth overseer. According to the journal, his actual name is Mortimer J. Denning von Krocknicker. He stands in front of the jeep with a menacing grin. You have been causing a lot of trouble, he says looking at Calvin. Olivia swings her gun around. Oh, please, my dear, that won't help you, von Krocknicker says. He pulls out a knife and stabs himself through the neck. He falls to the ground, apparently dead. There is a gust of wind, a whiff of ozone, and an identical copy and still very much alive von Krocknicker lands next to his own dead body. See what I mean, he says. Olivia lowers her rifle. Come with me, I have something to show you, the blackbird beckons. Seeing no other option, Calvin, Olivia, and Adam exit the jeep and follow the blackbird. As they walk, the world changes around them. The desert mountains fade away into blackness and find themselves in the near-apocalyptic London. Oh, it's good to be home, the blackbird says as they emerge onto a cobblestone street. You cannot stop the overseer's plans. However, I can give you an alternative. Let's see if any of you will take it. In front of each kill squad member appears a door. They have an uncontrollable urge to open their respective door and walk through. The blackbird stands smiling as he watches Calvin, Olivia, and Adam enter each of their portals. Adam enters his door and looks around. He is in Portland. His parents walk into the room. In this universe, his family has been granted asylum. Adam never has to interact with any SCPs or the Foundation. He is free to live a normal life. From the kitchen comes Calvin wearing an apron. He is holding a steaming pot. Adam locks eyes with Calvin, who smiles at him. The blackbird whispers into Adam's ear. In this reality, both of your parents and siblings are still alive. Also, the man you love loves you back. You and Calvin could be married if you stayed here. Wouldn't that be nice? Olivia enters her door. She is on the deck of a yacht. At the bow sits an easel with art supplies. The man that Olivia once loved walks across the deck towards her. The blackbird looms over her. In this reality, you didn't accidentally kill him. This could be your happily ever after. Wouldn't that be nice? Calvin steps through his door. He is in a grassy clearing near a lake. The blackbird hisses in Calvin's ear. I'm giving you the opportunity to save your mother this time, Calvin. You were just a scared little boy. But in this reality, you can be brave. You can actually save your mother from her fate. No! Calvin screams. This isn't real! The blackbird cackles. Calvin looks away from the lake and towards the tree line. Hidden in the shadows, he can just barely make out a hooded figure. Calvin walks towards it. The blackbird follows. He is screaming at the person in the tree line. I was only trying to help! The hooded figure reaches out and hands Calvin a metal tube. He opens it to find a set of eyeglasses inside. Calvin puts them on and turns to look at the blackbird. He steps back in horror. The glasses have revealed the true form of the blackbird. He is a winged pseudo-avian monstrosity full of rage. The mysterious hooded figure directs Calvin to open the tube again. Inside is an interdimensional fishing line made by Dr. Wondertainment and a white wiffle ball bat. Calvin grabs the fishing line and wraps it around 05-5's leg. The blackbird flies into the air trying to get away from Calvin, but Calvin wraps the other end of the fishing line around his arm. The blackbird begins to jump from dimension to dimension trying to get rid of Calvin. They appear on the deck of SCP-455, in Site-19 where SCP-682 walks freely, in the dead world of SCP-2935. Every time they stop in a new dimension, Calvin takes the opportunity to attack the blackbird with the bat and it seems that he is slowly weakening the monster. They finally land at the bottom of a deep well foundation containment site, where the dark body that is SCP-001 is contained. Standing in front of the containment field is Allison Cho, the Black Queen, whose sole mission is to destroy the foundation. You! cries the Blackbird. You are the one who has been helping Lucian! The Black Queen nods her head. Yes, 
I have been helping Calvin Lucian to eliminate you and the other overseers. The Foundation must fall. You are nothing! You cannot stop me! I am the Black King! Screams 05-5. Allison Chow sighs. She pushes a button on the panel next to her, shutting down the array containing the dark body. Out of the cloud of dust appears SCP-001, a massive black creature who seemed to absorb all light. No, stop! Shrieks the blackbird. SCP-001 does not move, but the room begins to shake. The blackbird continues to scream as his body folds in on itself until he is reduced to a single superheated point and then blinks out of existence. Allison Chow then reactivates the containment array, sealing 001 away once again. I will return you to your reality along with your friends, says the Black Queen, but perhaps our paths shall cross again, Calvin Lucian. There is a bright flash of light, and Calvin finds himself on a private jet sitting next to Olivia and Adam. They are all shaken, but the Blackbird is oh. dead. 05-5 has been eliminated. The three members of the team sit silently, still pondering what might have been if they stayed in the alternate realities. Suddenly, the phone on the plane begins to ring, breaking the silence. Calvin picks it up. On the other line is the fourth overseer. He has contacted Calvin to discuss surrendering to the insurgency. Unfortunately, things do not always go as planned. Calvin Lucian is about to make the most difficult and dangerous decision of his life. Aaron Siegel, better known to Foundation members as O5-1, descends into the abyss of a Deepwell site. He exits the elevator and peers into the optical scanner to unlock the reinforced door. Inside the room is Mobile Task Force Tau-5, Samsara. Aaron Siegel refers to these immortal cyborg clones created from the flesh of a dead god as his red right hand. Your mission is to eliminate the traitor 05-4 and to find the insurgents who have been killing the members of the Overseer Council. The cyborgs stand at attention. Now, Aaron Siegel screams. The soldiers of the red right hand march out the door to start their mission. Aaron Siegel pauses for a moment and then slams his fist against the wall in frustration. He has lost nine overseers to Calvin Lucian and his kill squad team. They have been somehow overcoming the odds each time and eliminating each overseer they tracked down. It wasn't supposed to end this way. Aaron Siegel vows to kill them all. Calvin Lucian, meanwhile, sits on a private jet with Adam and Olivia. He had just hung up the phone after a conversation with 05-4. The overseer known as the Ambassador wants to surrender to the insurgency. There's a good chance this is a trap, but Calvin has decided to meet with the Ambassador all the same. Calvin drops off Adam and Olivia at an insurgency base. They still haven't fully recovered from the previous mission with 05-5, known as the Blackbird. Before leaving, though, Calvin meets with an insurgency agent named Sylvester Sloan, who is going to join him as support. Calvin says goodbye to Adam and Olivia, then leaves with Sloan to meet the Ambassador in South Africa. After landing at Johannesburg Airport, Calvin and Sloan disembark and are led to a conference room where the Ambassador sits waiting for them. Calvin and Sloan sit across from O5-4 to discuss his surrender. The Council is in shambles, says the Ambassador. Everything is falling apart. I want to offer my services and information to the insurgency in exchange for protection from O5-1. He has lost his mind. Calvin agrees to the terms and prepares for extraction. But as they get up from the table, gunshots can be heard from down the hall. The ambassador's eyes open wide in terror. It's too late, he whispers. Calvin and Sloan grab the ambassador, who is frozen in fear, and exit the conference room. They make their way towards their plane, but the gunshots are getting closer. Calvin looks over his shoulder to see Samsara pursuing them through the terminal. Calvin shoves the ambassador behind a table as bullets whiz overhead. Calvin and Sloan return fire, but their volley doesn't seem to slow down the assassins. Calvin and Sloan pull the ambassador to his feet, and they burst through an emergency exit onto the sun-baked tarmac, where they make a mad dash for the plane. From behind them, a bullet rips through the chest of Sloan. The red right hand has caught up, but Calvin continues to drag the ambassador towards the plane. They are almost there. Suddenly, a metallic child's voice blares through the airport's external speakers. The child's voice says, I want Calvin Lucian alive. I have business to settle with him. 
the red right hand soldiers tackle Calvin and the ambassador to the ground when they are just feet away from the plane. Kill the traitor, the child's voice says, and Calvin can only watch helplessly as the ambassador is violently murdered. One of the agents turns towards Calvin and slams his fist into Calvin's face, causing him to black out. Calvin awakes in a dark room. He is unsure how much time has passed. The only light in the room comes from a screen on the wall. In the middle of the screen is a rotating red SCP Foundation seal. A voice from a speaker speaks. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is The Kid. I am the third overseer. You have killed all my friends, and now I will kill all of yours. The door to the room opens. Calvin leans through the doorway. There is a long, dimly lit hallway. The Kid orders him to proceed, so they can meet face to face. As Calvin walks, the Kid's voice echoes down the hallway. There once was another 05-3. He built incredible machines, even one that could see into the future. But unfortunately for him, he did not have the passion required to be an overseer. That was when I was… born. I was chosen by the other overseers to have my spinal cord severed in a way that gave me the ability of the all-seeing eye. I now watch everything, all of the time. I have perfect reasoning, perfect awareness, and perfect understanding. Calvin gets to the end of the corridor, which opens up into a large chamber. Tied up in the middle of the room are Olivia and Adam. Calvin runs to his friends and crouches down next to them. A mechanical suit stands on a platform looking down at Calvin, Olivia, and Adam. Calvin realizes the kid must be contained inside. I now sentence you all to death, the mechanical suit says as the red right hand steps out of the shadows and slowly walks towards the remaining members of the kill squad. Suddenly, there is a flash of light, and the Black Queen appears. Stop! What are you doing? shrieks the kid. The Black Queen hands Calvin the interdimensional rod and reel he used to defeat the Blackbird. Calvin casts the rod. From out of the terror in space comes a massive, multi-armed creature known as Maladramigion. The red right hand engages the monster, trying to force it back into its dimension, but the monster is too powerful. He grabs the cyborg clones and pulls them through the tear in reality. As Samsara battles the Maladramikion, Calvin frees Olivia and Adam. They make a run for the door, but as they flee, one of the walls opens up to reveal a turret. The gun fires, and a bullet hits Olivia directly in the head, killing her instantly. No! yells Calvin. Before Calvin can push Adam out of the way, a second bullet from the turret launches itself in Adam's back. Calvin and Adam slide across the floor. The kid in his mechanical suit jumps down from the platform above. I am going to kill you now, Calvin Lucian, he says in his mechanical voice. There is another flash of light. Calvin watches in front of him as the spear of the non-believer manifests itself before his eyes. Calvin grabs the spear and shoves it into the kid's machine body. It easily penetrates the armor and pins him to the wall. Calvin walks up to the exoskeleton and tears off the outer plating, revealing a tank full of fluid within which floats a malformed human fetus. As Calvin finally looks upon the kid's true form, he hears the sound of mocking mechanical laughter. Calvin breaks the glass and crushes the kid with his bare hands. As Calvin turns from the now silent robotic body of the kid, the room begins to shake, debris raining down from above. Calvin helps Adam up and puts Olivia's lifeless body across his shoulders. What remains of the kill squad makes their way out of the kid's lair. Outside of the foundation site where they were being held, Calvin helps Adam lie down on the ground before gently setting Olivia's body next to him. Adam grimaces as blood pours out of the wound in his back. Calvin reaches into his pocket and pulls out the vial of water from the Fountain of Youth. There are only a couple of drops left which he pours into Adam's mouth. Adam looks up at Calvin, tears filling his eyes. He whispers, I love you, before he passes out from the pain. The wound in his back begins to heal instantly, and Calvin calls an insurgency evac team to come pick up Adam. With Adam safe, Calvin picks up Olivia and walks alone towards a truck in the lot outside of the Foundation's site. He needs to finish this once and for all. He will kill the last two overseers, or he will die trying. 05-1 Aaron Siegel arrives at where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet, the Garden of Eden. He is in a frenzy due to the assassinations of all the other overseers besides himself and the Nazarene, and nothing will stop him. As he approaches the gate to the Garden of Eden, though, 
he is stopped by the Guardian of the Garden, a massive, powerful, anomalous entity with a flaming sword. But Aaron Siegel has no time or patience for anything to get in his way, even something as powerful as the Gate Guardian. The Guardian swings his burning sword at Adam, who rolls out of the way and, in a flash, takes out a Scranton reality anchor. He slams the anchor into the ground, which causes the world to shimmer and ripple around him. He watches as the flames from the Gate Guardian's sword seem to absorb back into its body before it shrinks down, looking to fold in on itself until all that is left is a charred skeleton. With the Guardian defeated, Eren sprints into the garden. He searches the garden for 05-2, but can't find her anywhere. He finally comes to the Tree of Life, and that's where he finds her. Laying at the base of the tree in a pool of blood is the Nazarene. She has taken her own life. This is her anomalous power, though. She has died many times before, yet death always spared her and brought her back. But somehow, he knows this time is final. Aaron drops to his knees and screams in frustration. For all the power Aaron Siegel possesses, there's nothing he can do now. He sits next to the Nazarene's body for hours, hoping that she might wake up, or that he will, to find that this was all a dream. After sitting next to her cold body for some time, he notices something in her snowy white hand. It's a note. In it, the Nazarene explains that she was the one who gave the vials from the fountain to Calvin Lucian, and that she is the one who made the spear appear before him that he used to kill the kid. She explained that while she died many times and death always brought her back, each time she felt less and less like herself, less and less like Dr. Sophia Light. She hoped that maybe if things ended up like this, it would give Aaron the chance to walk away and live the life that they might have been able to have together. But she knows deep down that Aaron's fate is to meet Calvin and finish things once and for all. Aaron Siegel screams in rage, clutching the node in his hand. He tries to summon death, but no one comes. Aaron Siegel is alone. He stands up and walks deeper into the garden. He walks until he reaches a spot where even God's light does not reach. In this desolate land is an impact crater, where Lucifer, star of the morning, had fallen. In the middle of the crater lies Lucifer's sword. Aaron Siegel descends into the hole and picks up the sword. He turns and exits the Garden of Eden. Aaron Siegel has only one mission in life now, to kill Calvin Lucian. Calvin reads the final entry of the journal. In it, the author warns that although he hopes the information contained within the journal is helpful, he hopes the reader does not try to use it. The words written on the final page are, this information will only lead you to a devastating end. Calvin closes the journal and looks up at the structure in front of him. He has made it to Site-01. He had left Olivia's body in a cave nearby, promising to her that he would make this right. He now walks up to the massive doors and places his hand on the knotted wood. The doors slowly creak open. Calvin pauses for a moment and looks behind him at the setting sun. He enters Site-01, where he knows 05-1 is, where Aaron Siegel waits. Inside the main hall, Calvin sees a giant doorway in the shape of the SCP Foundation seal, with artistic depictions of certain SCPs that he instinctively knows are special in some way. Standing next to the doorway is a two-meter tall man in what looks to be a futuristic suit. Calvin approaches and asks who this giant man is. He responds that his name is Purpose, the Red Right Hand. He is the guardian of 05-1, and none shall enter the Sanctum until he returns. He isn't here? asks Calvin. No, Purpose responds. He is. And with that, he steps aside and lets Calvin pass through the doorway. The doorway leads into a large room, where screens on the wall flash to life depicting moments from Calvin's journey, documenting his entire quest. Had he been in control at all? Or was this all a setup to lead him to this moment? As he walks forward, he finally sees him. Sitting at a table in the middle of the room is Aaron Siegel. You're 5 one Calvin asks. Aaron, the man responds. My name is Aaron. Calvin asks about the location of the second overseer, the Nazarene, but 05-1 doesn't respond. 
without needing any more information. Calvin pulls out his sidearm and in a flash fires off five shots. The bullet stopped in the air, inches from Aaron, before mm -hmm. dissolving in a flash of light. Calvin should have known it wouldn't be this easy. Stand up, Aaron Siegel! Calvin calls up as he holsters his gun. Let's finish it! Calvin pulled the spear of the non-believer from his back, but Aaron's only response was to laugh. <laughs> you don't even know why you're here, Aaron said. Calvin calls back, I'm here to kill you, because when I do, I kill the Foundation. Because when you're gone, the universe can finally heal. You're like me, Calvin Lucian. We are both men driven by our own convictions, regardless of the outcome. It would seem fate has brought us together. Now either your convictions will be broken or you will die, says Aaron Siegel. He then draws Lucifer's flaming sword and lunges towards Calvin Lucian. As the two men clash with one another, their supernatural weapons begin to destroy the room around them. Furniture is shattered, video screens are obliterated, and fire spreads across the walls. Aaron catches Calvin off balance and swings the flaming sword across Calvin's stomach. Calvin slides back from the impact, hunching over from the pain in his midsection. He brings his head up to see Aaron Siegel running towards him with the flaming sword high in the air. Calvin brings up the spear. From his knees, he leans back and launches it towards Aaron Siegel. The spear enters the final overseer's chest, the force from the throw pinning him against the wall. Aaron Siegel drops Lucifer's sword. It shatters as it hits the ground. He clutches the shaft of the spear protruding from his sternum with both hands. O5-1 looks at Calvin unbelievingly. <coughs> you have no idea what you've done. It was never about the overseers, Aaron Siegel says spitting out blood with every word. It was something deeper, something worse. Calvin walks slowly towards Aaron Siegel. He stops just in front of his final enemy. This is the way it ends, Calvin says. Aaron Siegel manages to whisper one final word, Sophia, before his body finally goes limp. Calvin turns to see Purpose standing behind him. He's dead, Calvin says, half to Purpose and half to himself. I killed him. After a moment, he asks Purpose what he really wants to know. There's a room in this facility where someone could unmake the foundation, right? Take me there. Without any hesitation, Purpose leads Calvin back to the room with depictions of important SCPs. There, Purpose opens the door to an elevator, but stops Calvin before he can get inside. I am duty bound to tell you, Purpose says, that once you step inside this elevator, there is no going back. There is only one decision to be made, and it is not one that can be unmade. I know, Calvin responds. It's time, before stepping inside. The elevator opens a door to reveal a room filled with bookcases and a huge window offering a beautiful view of the sun setting behind the mountains. On the wall are monitors depicting the ways he had killed all of the overseers, and in the middle of the room is a large desk with a computer. Calvin sits down at the desk and the computer comes to life. The computer prompts him to scan his fingerprint, which it accepts. He's logged in. The computer screen displays numerous locations around the planet, and he quickly recognizes that they are all SCP Foundation sites. Then he sees the single option the computer is giving him, terminate. Calvin reaches out with his finger. This is it. Once he presses this button, the SCP Foundation will be no more. His finger is millimeters from the button when the phone rings. Calvin hadn't even noticed that there was a phone on the desk. Calvin stares at it for a moment, then picks it up. Hello, he says. The voice on the other line responds. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is the administrator. I've been following your work for some time now, and I must say I am impressed. I have just been informed that you have completed your mission. Congratulations are in order. What the hell are you talking about? Calvin asks. Please listen, says the voice on the other line. The man you just killed was once in the same exact position you are in now. Granted, it was a very long time ago, but Aaron Siegel originally was trying to destroy the Foundation. That was until I convinced him otherwise. And now, like Aaron Siegel, you will become the new head of the Foundation. Like hell I will, yells Calvin. I could hang up and walk away right now and be done with all this. You could, continues the administrator. But if no one is in charge of the SCP Foundation, 
millions of people will die, if not billions, and then nobody would be there to manage what comes after. There is silence from Calvin. That's what I thought, says the administrator. I look forward to working with you, Calvin Lucian. Or should I say, 05-1, the line goes dead. The Ouroboros Cycle, one of the biggest, most legendary series of entries in the history of the SCP Foundation. We've covered the events of this SCP-001 epic in six videos, which we definitely recommend you watch before this one to avoid your brain exploding from the sheer scope of it all. Because that's the thing about the Ouroboros Cycle. It's a story so big, sprawling, and dense that it can feel almost like an anomaly itself. Whether you're immersed in the possible origin of the Broken God, the sentient black hole that can destroy the whole universe, or Calvin Lucian's quest to assassinate the O5 Council, it can sometimes be difficult to see the forest from the trees. But worry not, because that's exactly why we're here today. We're going to step back and look at this anomalous odyssey as a whole and ask the big question, why is it all here together? What makes these four different storylines, the children, the broken god, atonement, and the way it ends one big cycle? As with anything involving the SCP Foundation, there's always going to be an element of personal interpretation, but now that we've gone through the whole cycle, we think it's worth adding our two cents to the proceedings. So let's start broad. A question you've probably been wondering is, what do the words Orboros Cycle actually mean, and what is their significance to the four stories within? While the spelling can differ, Orboros refers to the ancient symbol of a snake or dragon eating its own tail, forming a circle a direct connection to the concept of cycles. The Arboros symbol has existed in a huge number of cultures, from the ancient Egyptians to the ancient Greeks to modern Gnostic traditions. It's often used in alchemy or other magical practices and has a variety of meanings such as eternal life, the endless cycle of death and rebirth, and the cycle of renewal. Anyone familiar with the tales within the Arboros cycle is probably already noticing some similarities. Cycles are a common theme in all of these works. People endlessly repeat mistakes, threats thought to be contained or destroyed return, and oftentimes, those who go out on a quest to destroy something end up becoming what they wish to destroy in the first place. In a cycle, there is no true end and no true beginning. Everything repeats endlessly. But let's start at the closest thing to the beginning we have, the children. In this tale, the Foundation faces off against a terrifying reality-warping group of interests known as the Kingdom of Abaddon. This nasty group which came from the Sahara Desert could seemingly take anything the Foundation threw at them, and were able to straight-up vaporize anyone who got too close. If the Kingdom was able to amass enough power, it could spell the end of the Foundation, and even the subjugation of the human race. Enter 05-1, a reoccurring character in the Ouroboros Cycle. This outside-the-box thinker put all his chips on the Twins of God project, designated SCP-001, like many anomalies before and after it. This project would infuse a human being with godlike powers, but it was a power so great that it seemed to kill anyone who attempted to accept it. Needless to say, this was a major bummer for 05-1. But through relentless human experimentation, even sacrificing the population of entire towns to the project, he eventually came up with a solution. A horrifying solution, but a solution nonetheless. He found that a group of nine children, with ages varying from 4 to 11, could act as a human conduit for 001's power. And as a result, it could be a weapon capable of turning the tide against the Kingdom of Abaddon. During the testing phase, though, it seemed like O5-1 went a little mad with power. He vaporized an entire church of the Broken God place of worship, and used the power of the children to wipe a few others off the map at his own discretion. His abuses of power got so flagrant that the administrator himself was called in to get a handle on the situation. And surprise, surprise, 05-1 disintegrated him too before disappearing himself shortly afterwards. In the end, the children were deemed too dangerous to be practical, both because of their anomalous powers and from the level of ambient radiation they put out. All nine were locked in radiation-proof boxes and buried in the desert, though they each show signs of life to this day. While this may seem disconnected from the rest of the series, it actually establishes some of the most important reoccurring themes and ideas of the cycle as a whole. 
namely the Foundation messing with reality and performing horrific acts to achieve their goals, the corruption of the O5 Council, and the fact that these grand attempts to change or save the world often blow up in everyone's faces, sometimes literally. We also have the introduction and apparent death of the mysterious administrator. But trust us, all is not what it seems with this one. The ripple effect beginning here will affect everything going forward. Next, the Broken God. This tells the chaotic story of a magical clockwork box which is worshipped by the Church of the Broken God as a conduit to their deity, and eventually becomes an all-devouring mechanical kaiju. The beast soon dubbed SCP-001 devoured and consumed all the metal around it, slowly becoming larger and more destructive. If the Foundation didn't take it out before it reached critical mass, they'd be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a bona fide god, a fight they really weren't sure they could win. Thankfully, and with a little anomalous help from SCP-2399, the Foundation was able to destroy the anomaly. They removed its clockwork heart from the wreckage and contained the anomalous scrap that once comprised its destructive body. However, the Foundation soon realized that you just can't keep a good god down. The clockwork heart eventually evaded Foundation containment while being shipped to a secondary location and instead ended up in a small town. Here it began to influence the minds of the residents into more subservient broken god cultists, intent on building him back up to his former glory. It'd be easy to discount the broken god as an outlier, seeing as the Foundation came out looking much better here than they do in any of the other Orboros tales. But when you look carefully, its place in the overall cycle is clear. The entry ends the way it begins, with the heart of the broken god influencing humans to carry out its bidding. The Foundation had to intervene in between these two instances, but in the end there was no net loss to the Broken God itself. In a sense, the Foundation is doomed to encounter the same problems again and again, continually defending the world from the same anomalous threats. And the Foundation needs to succeed every time to maintain peace and normality. A major anomalous threat only needs to succeed once to drag everything into disarray. In many ways, that is the curse of the SCP Foundation. Speaking of major anomalous threats, now it's time for part 3 of the Ouroboros Cycle, Atonement. Once again we start off with the Foundation meddling with cosmic scale powers with the creation of the Area 11 Pietrical Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array. Try saying that three times fast. That was a machine so powerful, it was capable of creating a singularity. Though what it actually ended up doing was turning Dr. Calvin Desmet into an abomination. More specifically, into a kind of immensely powerful humanoid black hole, whose powers were only restrained by the very machine that created him. Think of him as kind of a malicious Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. This new entity, dubbed SCP-001, presented a grim prophecy and an ominous offer. He told the O5 Council that anomalies were leaking into their universe from other realities, and soon the anomalous threat would destroy them all. His offer was to, upon his release, wipe out the rest of the multiverse entirely, leaving only our reality free from anomalous threats. Unsurprisingly, it was O5-1 that was most interested in this offer, so much so that he held a vote and murdered everyone who voted against the decision to release SCP-001. Having built his consensus among the survivors on the Council, O5-1 let SCP-001 out. Unsurprisingly, this turned out to be a terrible decision, as one of his first acts upon being freed was to kill the members of the O5 Council that had just voted to release 001, saying that they themselves were anomalous and needed to be purged to atone for their past sins. The only survivor was a member of the Council who abstained from the vote, who was able to recontain SCP-001 inside the Pietrical Fontaine array, for now. Once again, the thematic connections to the rest of the Ouroboros cycle is clear. We have a world-ending anomaly held off, but only temporarily, buying time before the cycle inevitably continues. We have the Foundation abusing its power and signing off on the death of countless people in other dimensions. And, of course, the O5 Council stepped out of their bounds and actively warped reality, just like they had with the children before. Their chickens truly come home to roost, though, in the final part of the cycle. Appropriately named The Way It Ends, this piece chronicles the story of Calvin Lucian and the Kill Squad, an elite group of four Chaos Insurgency soldiers with one goal, assassinating the entire O5 Council, 13 of the most powerful people in the world. 
Why? Because they've been messing with reality itself time and time again. And it's getting to the point that their selfish meddling could finally destroy everything. And given that we've already seen it happen with the children and the entity that Dr. Calvin Desmond became, it's hard to disagree with them. What follows is one of the longest and most complicated tales in all of the Foundation, as the Kill Squad systematically encounters and kills each insane, anomalous member of the O5 Council. In order to do this, they need to make deals with death itself, fight giant serpents, cross dimensions, deal with SCP-610 and SCP-682 containment breaches, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Samsara, arguably the Foundation's deadliest mobile task force. A number of other insane things happen along the way, like O5-1 murdering the Gate Guardian with the Scranton Reality Anchor, and the Black Queen, the most prominent member of the Serpent's Hand helping our heroes defeat more overseers. In the end, Calvin Lucian, despite losing almost everything, reigns victorious in the final battle. Using the Spear of the Non-Believer, a weapon so powerful it can kill gods, Calvin managed to finally kill the top member of the Overseers, O5-1. With the O5 Council destroyed, Calvin set about completing his final task, destroying the entire SCP Foundation. But that didn't happen. Instead, he was contacted by a mysterious and immensely powerful being known as the Administrator, who gave him some frightening news. He'd just been hired by the SCP Foundation to be their new O5-1. This was where our last video on the Arboros series left us. What happens next, you may ask? How does Calvin respond to this offer he seemingly can't refuse? In this case, it seems that the administrator, of being so completely tied to the nature of the Foundation itself, is SCP-001. And while it seemed that the Overseers were mad with power, they were actually always there to keep the Administrator in check. Aaron Siegler, the O5-1 that Calvin had just killed, was doing the exact same thing Calvin was doing when he became O5-1, trying to destroy the Foundation. But the Foundation and the Administrator cannot be beaten, they can only be joined. And that's exactly what Calvin did, becoming the new O5-1, turning his back on the Chaos Insurgency, and rebuilding the rest of the Council and the Foundation in his own image. Insurgency members who were once his allies vowed revenge for this betrayal, perhaps suggesting that history would go on to repeat itself once more in the future. Because at the end of the day, that's what the Ouroboros cycle really is. The reoccurring threat and the changing of the guards that accompanies it. There will always be a Foundation. There will always be an Administrator there will always be an O5 Council. Nothing starts, nothing ends. All that ever changes are the names and faces involved. Whether it's Calvin Lucian or Aaron Siegler, the wheel keeps turning. The snake devours its own tail. The Ouroboros cycle is, and forever will be, eternal. Now go check out our full piece-by-piece -piece breakdown on the Ouroboros cycle starting with SCP-001 The Children, and then check out SCP-5000Y, the full story compilation, just in case we haven't blown your mind enough for one day.